This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Jumbo, jumbo, hello and a very good morning to all of you and welcome to the Maasai Mara Game Reserve of Kenya. We've got that beautiful view because we have a nice morning, great uh, sunshine we have and as you sure, my name is David and on camera with me this morning's Bungay. Bungay, how are you doing, sir? And we're excited that you have joined us for our morning drive. Now, we have this great view we want to show you, which is a very typical habitat of the Masimara game. And I'm talking about the savannah. And remember, we are coming to you live. Should you have any questions or comments, please send them through and you can tweet using hashtag World Earth. My plans uh, this Sunday morning is to go close to the Mara River. And after that, I'll try and chance and see if I could be lucky to see a crossing or anything similar to that. Look at that view. The river is not very far from where I am, and from a distance where you see those big trees, we had seen uh, some lions that were feeding on a buffalo, and I also want to go there and investigate how much of that buffalo is left at the moment. Hello, Anna. Very good morning. Welcome. I'm already stationed at the river. Yes, my name is Isaac, and on camera I have Big James. Already, we are here, set to show you what's going to happen at the river. Remember to talk to, uh, to us on CGTN Wild or hashtag Wild Earth. Questions and comments are very, very welcome. It's another exciting, beautiful morning. Here we have topies and zebra ready to want to cross. We had a few touch the water, then went back. I must say we are very fortunate to have arrived here before they crossed. Although now that we're here, we don't know how much longer it will take for them to cross. But the good thing is I am here. Stay there. Uh, please remember this is a live, um, I, this is live coming to you from the Masai Mara. This is not recorded, so please sit back and enjoy. Already, um, you can tell, these are the zebra, I think, that didn't cross yesterday. We did have a very big crossing yesterday. These guys didn't cross. I assume they waited until this morning. There is a few more topies, unlike yesterday. And to go, they go. So I'm hoping one is gonna leap in. The problem is at the water, I don't know if you can see it, there is a crocodile facing upstream. That is a hindrance. And I think, you know, that one, you know, he has eaten enough. Yes, uh, you know, he has eaten enough and he doesn't care. It's like, you know, he's saying, you know, until I'm hungry, that's when you're gonna cross so I can, you know, get one of, uh, another one of you. But if one decides to go, it usually, it's, they don't care about, you know, the crocodile. Okay, what's going to happen here? Very cautious toppy, as usual. But once it goes, everybody will go. When it happens, I don't know. Okay, spooked a little bit. Remember, this is one of the most famous crossings. It is a crossing that they have used over the years, and they're always using it. You know, we didn't see crossings in the last almost 10 days, but since yesterday and the day coming, the day is coming, we have one or two crossings because there is a good number of wildebeest across the other side. Apart from that is 
uh, is that you know from the southern side from the Serengeti news are those ones that had already started going back because we've had lots of rain up here uh, they're starting to come back so that is the reason update that we've received yesterday a very big number of the wildebeest that had crossed to northern Serengeti has you know crossed back to the Mara to the Mara Triangle and they're headed northwest towards you know where we are in camp um, uh, when I say that is where our camp is and it will be it looks like it's going to be exciting coming days for all of us already you can tell people have arrived all in anticipation of seeing our crossing today what a you beautiful morning the light is just amazing yeah the smell is uh, superb very very fresh fills your lung with lots of you know fresh air the sun is just perfect you know i cannot not ask for anything more yeah it's a wonderful morning i must say remember to um you know talk to me talk to us uh, hashtag uh, cgtn wild Emily, good morning. I don't know what time it is, where you are. Um, you ask, you know, how often do crocodiles hunt? Very, very good question. They hunt when they need to eat. And that means, you know, almost every time there is a chance, they will go for it. I have seen in my experience over here in this river where they kill and not eat. So they were just fun very much like their land you know cousins the lions it's another predator they'll just kill for fun crocodiles can hunt every day and sometimes just for fun yesterday i saw a very interesting behavior where they caught a zebra and then you know you know, you know uh, continued to play with it biting it diving it you know with it down rolling around but not breaking or eating anything so you know, it's very interesting to just sit here by the river. Uh, it's, there's never a dull moment because there's always something to learn, even for us. He, here, you know, in the bush, you know, this is a very exciting moment of the year and it's uh, always important for you to share or show you and learn about the beautiful migration. From the southern plains of the Serengeti, over a million grazers move northwest through the western corridor, gathering along the banks of the Grumeti River. Once the chaos of the rut comes to an end, the herds gallop north once again. In time, more than two million animals amount to feast on the abundance the Mara has to offer. But the reward of the red oat grass does not come easy. The zebra vanguard is the first on the banks, taking the plunge into the treacherous Mara River in order to reach the untouched long grass plains on the other side. Not only must they face the turbulent waters, but also the crocodiles, gliding through the rapids in anticipation. Then comes the body of the migration, the thundering herds of the white-bearded wildebeest, with their bleeds echoing through the landscape while in search for greener pastures. So too are the lions of the Mara, who patrol the banks of the river. The risks are known, but the herds are determined. All must make the leap. Some will fall, but for the survivors, the lush greenery that awaits is bountiful. And then, as is nature's way, it comes the time to cross the river again, as they continue to follow the life-giving storms and nourishing plains. Welcome back live to Juma, everybody, and indeed the circle of life, the Mara. What magnificent landscapes with those crossings of zebra and wildebeest. We found a different species of wildebeest down here. This is called the brindled or blue gnu, and uh, you never find them like this in the Mara, hidden in the thickets. They are, for the most part, open plains specialists. That's what they do. The migration is all about the grass. It's all about the wildebeest moving through the open plains. And these wildebeest have had to adapt to areas here in the Kruger that have become a little bit more densely wooded. And we've got a group of wildebeest here feeding after the rain. 
And they are together with their small herd of impala as well, just on the left. And uh, the lioness and male lion that were seen yesterday morning were around this area last night. I had their tracks just before. But on chatting with my colleagues on the radio, those lions have gone over to the west. So it's often a case we find when we come to this big open area that we have just outside our camp where we often find in Parla and Wildebeest hanging out. When we find them on this side, you know that a predator moved on the opposite side. And that is where the tracks of that lion and female lion were. And so it's often that predators have been around, how these animals are clumped together, how they've been moving. And they're trying to not in the middle. Oh, somebody snorted. Now, hanging out with the animals can often be quite fruitful because you'll often have predators trying to hunt them. So if they start behaving erratically or shouting, alarm calling, they got very good eyesight at spotting predators and often is a very, very good way of starting the morning to see the behavior of these impala. But the way they're behaving indicates that the lions moved quite some time ago. It's normally 45 minutes to an hour or so that these animals are still jumpy and skittish after being hunted, but it takes about that amount of time for them to sort of get easy again. Good morning and a very warm welcome to and beyond Pinder Private Game Reserve. Have a look at this group of giraffes over there. My name is Damon and behind the camera we've got Craig. We've got quite an exciting plan for the morning. There was a female cheetah not far from here last night who uh, had killed an impala. We found the carcass just about finished and we're going to go check through some open areas to see if maybe she's chosen one of those to rest for the night this group of giraffe behind us. Those two closest to us, see how they've got their heads buried in the bushes, busy feeding? When we got here, they were busy uh, play fighting. So two young bulls just taking each other's measure, swinging their necks at each other. But it seems now they've had enough of their bout of play fighting, and now it's time to get down to the serious business of feeding. Look at that one there. Quite a, quite a chilly morning here and uh, quite windy here at Ambient Pinder. Lots of grey cloud overhead. Amy, you're asking a very good question. You're asking how you can tell the difference between a male and a female giraffe. Well, Amy, from, if you can see underneath the belly, then that's the most surefire way to, to tell. With males, you can see their genitals on their, the underside of their belly or between their back legs. Um, obviously, you won't with a female. But then, from a distance, if you can't see, if you can only see their head, you can have a look at the horns, Amy. Um, so with males, because like I said, they use their horns for, for fighting. Their horns are quite a bit more robust, and as they get older, the males will get bald patches, or the, the, the tops of their horns, or ossicones, will, will become bald with a female, because they don't use their horns for fighting. They're much thinner, and they have a little tuft of hair on the top of the horn there. So see the one there that we've got in screen now? Have a close look, Amy, at the top of its horns. See those very bald, gray patches there where the hair's all fallen out? and see how thick and robust those horns are and that tells us that this particular giraffe is a male. Lovely to see all of these giraffes all feeding through this little clearing here and just like Steve was saying with the impala how they can be very useful to help you to to help you to find uh, oh sorry just come back to that now. Lin Ma, you're asking why these giraffes are so pale. Well, Lin Ma, uh, I think it's partially because they, well, most of these giraffes here are, are, are males and are quite young. And often with male giraffe, the older they get, the darker they get. 
Um, but then otherwise, Lynmar, it just comes down to genetics. Uh, you get giraffes that are super, super pale, and then you get giraffes that are super dark in color. It all just depends on their, on their genetics. I suppose also throughout Africa, it also depends on the different subspecies. There's quite a few different subspecies of giraffe throughout Africa, and they've all got slightly different patterns and different uh, colors to their coats. But these, often with, with very old giraffe bulls, they often take on a very dark color to, to their coats and perhaps these, these younger bulls will also take on that same color once they get older. Impossible to say for now. But as I was saying, like Steve was saying with the, with the Impala, how they can be very useful in terms of helping us to locate predators because they'll alarm call if they see a predator. It's quite similar with these giraffe as well. Um, if a giraffe sees a lion or sees a leopard or even a cheetah, even though a cheetah is not going to be a threat to, an, uh, to a big giraffe like this, if they do see a cheetah, They'll often stand and they'll stare in the direction of the cheetah and you can tell by the fact that their ears are pricked forward and their body is all tense and they're busy staring at that uh, in, in the direction of, of where that predator is. Uh, and if you follow their gaze, very often you can be rewarded well, well, with, with, with finding a predator. And sometimes they'll even make a hissing sound if they see a cheetah or a leopard lying down. Um, and then that's normally an even more surefire way to tell that there is some sort of potential danger there. Um, sometimes giraffe will also stare at each other and then you can, yeah, you end, up, you end up getting all excited and trying to see what they're looking at and, oh no, it's just another giraffe or um, another, another little animal that's maybe moving around in the grass that's gotten their attention, something like a warthog. But we're going to be paying very close attention to animals like these giraffe as we move off to go and search that clearing. It's still pretty early in the morning, and so this cheetah would have no doubt rested. Sassy Cassie, you're asking how often lions hunt giraffe here at Pinda. Sassy Cassie, um, because there's an abundance of, of smaller prey, of easier to catch prey, so to speak, things like anyalas and warthogs, uh, it doesn't happen that often that lions here will try and hunt adult giraffe. Um, giraffe calves and young giraffes, that happens fairly frequently. Uh, just because a giraffe is a very big animal, it's got very long legs and big hooves that could easily injure a lion. Um, and so a lion will normally, if it can, if it can help it, it'll try and choose an easier, an easier target. Uh, but Sassy Cassie, I have seen, well, I've seen a couple of carcasses of young, young giraffes that have been killed by lions. Um, and then I've seen maybe one or two adult giraffes where we thought, not 100% sure, but we thought that perhaps lions had, had brought them down. All right, like I said, myself and Craig are going to leave these giraffes and we're going to make our way towards that open clearing, go see if there's any sign of that female cheetah. Hello everyone, sorry for the rolling start, but we have a Tandy and she's making her way out of Juma into torture. My name is Trishana and I've got Glenn. She's almost here, she's almost here. She's just caught a scrub here. Look at that, this is just, I get a very brief sighting of her because she is going about to leave our property. Look at her, so proud. She's even giving you all the look. Head in mouth, just gonna mind our rain roof there. Just gonna tuck my head. Isn't she gorgeous? Nothing like a leopard for the morning. Now she's literally, if she takes a few steps to her right, she's going to be inside Torchwood. Off she goes, so we won't be able to follow her, but we will be able to see her for a little bit. I'm going to move forward. Let's try and get as many views of her as possible. Because like I said, this is going to be a short sighting because of her movements. So let's just pop up here. And 
watch her for a little bit. There we go. Now, we do have our rain roofs on because it has been quite rainy all night in Juma. So we have to be extra careful when we're driving around. Look at her, so, so proud. So she's going into Torchwood, like I explained, which is on our western, uh, eastern boundary, sorry. And that is generally where she likes to stash her cub. Now, leopardesses will do that, keep their cub in a nice, safe place, and then bring back some food, or they'll hoist a kill and then call their cub to it. And a lot of you are wondering if she's taking it to her cub, very, very likely. Otherwise, she would have eaten it right then and there because a scrub here is not exactly the type of kill you would hoist. So she is almost definitely taking it to her cub. I don't know if you can hear the paw, paw in the background. Those are some nearby kudu that have gotten sight or smell of Tandi and are alarming. I think I can try for one last view. I think I can try for one, one last view. She's going further and further in. I'm just gonna push my nose in here ever so slightly. Off in the distance. And... And that is all, folks. That is Tandy for you. Well, wasn't that special? I thought that was very special. I'm so happy that we managed to get you just in time to catch her going across. There's our leopard for the morning. Beautiful, beautiful to see a uh, Tandy carrying a scrub here, taking it to her cub and talking about eating. We have another predator here that doesn't have a scrub here, but have a bigger prey than a scrub here. We are talking of an African buffalo. Now we've got one boy, a youngster here, male, feeding on that buffalo, and either the brother or cousin to the left, if you look carefully, who I think is very well fed. Now, these two youngsters come from uh, a pride of lions that we call the River Pride Lions. They come from the River Pride. And not sure they have started to form the... We have been here two, three days, and we haven't seen any females. And I am not 100% sure they brought this buffalo down themselves. Though it is possible, we have seen young males, sub like this, doing that. If the prey of the buffalo was maybe very old, or maybe it was uh, sickly, or maybe it had some injury of some sort, but most possibly, they would have brought it down themselves. Very majestic walk towards breakfast, like Tandy was walking. I would say they come from the same litter, these two boys here. If you look at them in terms of size, they look very similar to each other. Possibly, they are of the same litter. It's time to share breakfast together. I'm not sure you can hear them tearing the flesh. By the way, look at those bellies. They are so full. And from where we are, I'm tr I've been trying to smell uh, this carcass. It's still very fresh. We have had some rains here in the Maasai Mara every afternoon, and it has helped to keep it fresh because I think this could be the third or the fourth day of this kill, but apparently it's not smelling. It's not smelling at all. See, most of the flesh is gone. See how they're pulling 
the flesh and you have a break a little bit there. And not very far from where we are, we got some scavengers that are waiting. I'm looking at some vultures and some marabou stalk and some, I guess, some Tony Eagle. And the pecking order here is until the lions leave this carcass, they're not going to get down. As scavengers I'm talking about. On the very top there is a marabou stalk. And there's an eagle there, I'm guessing that could be the Tony Eagle and an African white backed vulture. I'll spend a few more minutes here and find out if there could be other lions or, the, or other lionesses and know who exactly could have brought this buffalo down. I've just stopped at these kudu that still have their attention on Tandi's movements in the east. Now, obviously, I can't see her anymore, but they are still very alert, and they've been alarming just slightly. They have a very deep bark. We call that alarm call a bark. It's very, very deep and very reliable. And it would be wonderful if you could hear the sound of it. You know the sound of an impala alarm call? Very nasal. <laughs> While the kudu is a bit deep, it goes ba ba. And for me, they're the most reliable creatures when it comes to locating a predator. You can see they're quite fluffy. And that's obviously because of this overcast weather. They might also be a little bit damp from the night's rain. The rain only stopped at about five and then it started again around six. So it's still quite wet. Now they'll puff themselves up so they can insulate themselves with an extra layer of air between the hairs that stand up. We call these hairs standing up pilo erection. And each one of those hairs have tiny, 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 minuscule little muscle that contracts to pick the hair up and trap air. It's almost like uh, an extra layer of clothing in the same way that when you're cold, the hairs on your body stand up. It's your body's attempt to keep you warm. And like you would know, it's not a conscious decision to pick your body up. And it isn't one for them either. It's an automatic motor response. You can see they're still quite alert, but Tandi is well and truly into Torchwood now. So I'm going to move on and check out an old hyena den that's not too far away. Thank you, Trish, and welcome back to the other side of Druma, everybody, where we've caught up with a herd of elephants. And you can see by the, the darkness of their skin, that they've definitely been rained on at some point. Uh oh, she's going to she's going to relieve herself slightly while eating. It's a non-stop affair with elephants, everybody. They eat and eat and eat, and their digestive system is constantly working. Here is a, I think, actually a black monkey thorn or a baby knob thorn. Black monkey thorn. So, yay, Ellie's everyone's saying, well, they are definitely abundant at the moment, and uh, we are finding them all over the place. Nice little breeding herd lost in the woodlands here. We discussed drainage lines yesterday. It's sort of the lower areas in the landscape where the soil is a bit deeper and where the water always flows if it does rain. And there's a water table and these drainage lines are the areas where you find the tallest trees and often the trees with the leaves at this time of year and any grass is often a little bit longer and shade tolerant grasses which the elephants are now enjoying well, it's a very common place to find at least at the moment moving through the river rhine systems long the 
banks of rivers is called riparian or riveran. It's a very specific type of vegetation. It's often tall canopy trees. Uh, and that is because where the river has been flowing, there's a lot of deposited soil and often very deep soils. So trees can grow much taller. When we go up the slopes of these areas, the soil is very shallow. And when the soil's shallow, it's because the parent rock is quite close to the surface. It doesn't allow trees to get very tall. Okay, guys, uh, we have the first crosses and three have managed to get in and the crocodile is in hot pursuit. What is going to happen here? The current, oh, another one coming from the left. Oh dear, what is going to happen here? Whoa, yeah, the current is so strong, it is washing the topis downstream and actually helping them get away from the crocodiles. Well done, Topi. Well, that is one for the topi and zero for the crocodile they managed to cross the three the first ones of this morning have succeeded to go across it is not always um, the case to see topis crossing but we were very fortunate to see them you know cross i'm always you know happy when the topis cross because they're really fast and they really can get away from the crocodiles that was amazing guys i hope you enjoyed this we are on the banks of mara river and in between me and across the other side is mara river yes uh, what wow indeed this is the beautiful mara river they you know the livelihood of all animals in the mara these two crocodiles have already now parked they know it's going to happen and now they are just parked there waiting to swim like a submarine upstream whenever somebody you know gets gets into the water looks like the topis have changed tactics they don't like it here where are we gonna go to cross now they've gone away from the river remember this is uh, this always happens they come they see a crocodile they almost miss a near death and then they get out and decide we're not going to cross they go away even for half an hour then all of a sudden somebody decides let's go back they come and they go it was very unfortunate that that crocodile went for the topis soon after they jumped in because we would have seen more coming but who am i to predict anything here it's nature taking its course there is nothing that i can do apart from tell you or try and translate what exactly is happening what is happening here now they have decided to go to another crossing there is another crossing about 300 feet upstream from where i am so let's wait and see you know let's wait and see are they gonna go around or do we have somebody else wanting to come down here they're always followed by and the wildebeest it's not always the case because sometimes you find the zebras are the ones leading or the wildebeest it's a matter of who has got the urgency to get across beautiful wonderful like uh, uh, you know, i will remind you it is be very beautiful here the light the heat you know it's not hot it is very calm it is very fresh we had rains yesterday so it's not dusty and you know the light is amazing for those uh, who take pictures it is uh, just uh... <laughs> Lucy <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for your question but it's rather an interesting question we say we build bridges for the animals to cross uh, we already have a few bridges but uh, I don't think they would use bridges um, that would be very awkward actually if they used bridges uh, and I think I don't think they would uh, prefer to use a bridge but uh, thank you for your comment thank you for your question I don't think they would use the bridge uh, and I don't think there's anybody who would want to build a bridge for them because then you will be interfering with nature's way of these animals you know doing their own thing so uh, thank you for your question Joe but it's a rather an interesting question thank you very much okay just to continue on looks like um, they have decided to change tactics are they gonna go down yeah 
there we go there's one going down is it gonna jump in that is a tricky area it's a bit rocky do we have a leader remember if there's no crocodile one gets in everybody will go looks like these topies are very determined are they gonna go there we go beautiful look at that beautiful Woo! that is a good jump yeah yeah they're succeeding they're going the current is really really you know heavy look at this yeah the current it's they're not going anywhere it's too strong the current amazing guys i hope you're enjoying this yeah, let me just leave you to enjoy it for a minute or so. Yeah, they're out of the frame. I don't know what is happening around that corner. I can't see anything. Hopefully they've made it. But I must say it's a very tricky area they chose because that a sheer bank back there. Uh, we'll be waiting to see what's gonna happen. But it's been very interesting because those were only like four before they crossed three close to me. Um, and they're not choosing, they're crossing wisely this morning. We we'll have another crossing uh, looks like the topi are really confusing everybody because they are did they make it oh yes they made it two of them are they look at how fast they're breathing yeah tension fear you no know, exhaustion yeah okay like i said the topis are really confusing everybody you know they go this way, they cross, three of them, they go that way, cross, come back, run this way. So the zebras look really, really confused. Okay, do we have more topic crossing? Let's wait and see. I hope you're enjoying this, guys. I'm loving it. I cannot ask for anything more. Remember your question, your comments, as we wait for this crossing to, you know, commence once more are very very welcome yeah we're we gonna go and find another crossing looks like somebody told them you have to cross today and they really want to cross and it's like you know i'm not waiting yeah the zebras now looks very confused you know do we follow them what do we do what are these guys doing that's why i'm not a topi maybe some of them are saying Pardon, pardon me, but uh, I'm here. Please ask me again, Ken. Ken, uh, are you asking, are the crocodiles really full? Yes, they are so full, you cannot believe it. Yesterday afternoon, I saw a good number of them just playing with a the carcass. They've been eating so well and actually the you know the high tide is an added advantage Woo! look at that yeah yeah our first zebra of this morning there we go beautiful enjoy this guys once more another crossing how lucky are we the current there is very very strong you notice how they struggle once they get there it becomes very difficult you know they seem to be moving but it looks like they're just on a treadmill yeah, the zebra is slightly heavier, so it's, you know, swimming much faster than the rest. Do we have more? Looks like not everybody is trusting everybody to go across. Yeah, a few cross. The others say, mm, I don't think that's a very good place to cross. They don't. Okay, we have another zebra. Quite a young one. Okay, let's wait and see. Yeah, we have some more. Going in. More and more. Beautiful. Look at that. remember this is something they do every year every time they get to the mara they have to cross from one side of the mara to the other 
You know, some people think, you know, you might think, you know, they're crossing from Kenya to Tanzania. No, this river meanders through Kenya up to northern Serengeti. So while in Kenya, they still have to cross from one side to the other. Look at that. That zebra is really a good swimmer. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, too rocky. Kate, 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 you ask about about something about Toppy. Please repeat again. Oh, Kate, you ask, you know, who are better sweepers, Toppy or Zebra? I would say, uh, I would give it to the Zebra. The Zebras are much better swimmers. The one thing about toppies is that they're swimmers, good swimmers, but they are not as heavy. So for the zebra, they have an added advantage. The weight and good swimming really helps them, you know, get across quicker. The toppies, their only disadvantage is they are good swimmers, but slightly lighter. And with a current like this, uh, are always, you know, if they're two together, the zebras will always win. That is my take. Um, in my opinion. Let's see, do we like a mare and her foal? Are they gonna go? I hope you're enjoying this, guys. This is live. Talk to us, CGTN Wild, hashtag Wild Earth. Yeah, I hope you're enjoying it like I am. It's a beautiful morning, like I've been saying. The light is just amazing. I'm sure those guys are taking really good pictures. Yeah, this is the time you want to be here to get that beautiful light, get the perfect pictures. Okay, are we, are we going to get another crossing? A very confused crossing this morning, or, uh, how I would put it, because, you know, it started very close to where I am, just across, went then a little bit up, and now it's stopped, and looks like they're congregating, and they might have a leader. Yeah. Uh, to start crossing looks like all the toppies have crossed and we might not have any more toppies because toppies don't waste time they just go when they want to go they don't waste time do we have more toppies james we have a wildy we have a wildy and looks like you know he you know he's an aged one that one so he must have you know made many many crossings very experienced and that's why he's, he's back the waiting later on you know you sometimes you can tell the experienced ones sometimes tend to um think twice stop look you know in the water and not really get interested that's my take also yeah beautiful here oh here are the ones that crossed for some reason they stayed at the bank i didn't notice that and now they've come looks like a complete dazzle you know a stallion mares and foals so maybe they didn't lose each other while crossing and that could be very good for the stallion because it's very difficult to gather new females there's lots of biting lots of kicking and no other males really give in to their female you know females that easily so he's a lucky guy he got his all family together and they crossed together okay here comes yeah the new cavalry, new entourage, so they want to go down, but let's see. Remember all these, you can see there, there's, the ground hasn't been worn out, so it means the area hasn't been used. And this is what is very interesting and always unpredictable. You, think, you, know, you find them going to a place where they had, you know, it hasn't been used for you know, even years and they just start using it. I'm gonna take a sip of water. You, you look at the confusion slightly. <laughs> Ellie, thank you for your question. You ask. How many animals cross each year? 
it is not documented or properly documented but maybe i'll talk about the whole you know, a little bit about the migration and the crossing then you might find an answer in between what i tell you is that during the crossing we have almost you know, 2.53 million animals not all of them make it to the river i would say maybe 1.5 make it you know to the mara and during that time you know maybe i would say 800,000 will crisscross the river at different points. I am, we have very, very many crossings, but you know, uh, about, I would estimate about 800,000 cross the Mara River. Okay, while I continue, um, you know, staying here at the river, I'll keep you updated with this uh, confusion that's um, just happened. And if they decide to do something, we'll be with you. Well, I think the most exciting uh, thing about the crossing of the wildebeest or zebras by the river it's the games they play of coming to the river and going back. I mean, before they make that very difficult decision whether they're going to cross, we spend so much time just by the riverside or by the banks of the river waiting for them. And the times you get, like if the other tourists there having the cameras ready and like, they come so close to the water and then they go back. But I think for me personally, I'm enjoying some wonderful stuff. I still have my buffalo here and I have got elephants uh, from a distance. But let's have a quick look at the, uh, the buffalo first because... Karina, this killer thinks three days old. And if you were watching earlier, it has been tossed over from the way it was before. Now the two youngsters have left it, but they're very close to that bush that you see on the right. It doesn't smell. Don't be surprised that, Karina, these two male lions would keep it for the next three days until it starts getting muggled and very smelly. Uh, these lions will still keep eating it as much as they can. I think they got too full, but they're keeping an eye because earlier we saw one single hyena coming very close and the scavengers we're showing you before are still there and both the hyenas and the vultures know that these lions are not far. Now, lions and buffaloes are motor enemies and especially here in the Masimara and we're going to learn more about the same. During the long rains when the migration herds of wildebeest and zebra are in the Serengeti, the lions of the Mara focus their attention on hunting buffalo. Male lions even youngsters can be a powerful asset on the hunt for the large and often temperamental buffalo. Lion attacks are strategic, seeking out the weak, injured and lonely. With youth comes ambition and the males prove their worth charging first. The lions will then surround their target, taking turns to attack its rump, avoiding the dangerous horns. To limit the risk of injury, the lions will attempt to ground the buffalo as quickly as possible. But the added power of a battle-scarred male lion is the final blow. Taking down such a beast is not an easy feat, but necessary nourishment before the bounty of the migration arrives. Welcome back 
Well, it's always very interesting when those two meet, lion and buffalo. It's not um, one of those predictable you know, fights, but it can go either way. Well, back to the river and as quickly as it gets exciting, it can really come down that fast. All of a sudden, there is sudden calm. Looks like heads are being put together and they're trying to decide what is the next move. You can see very relaxed. Even the wildebeest are bewildered of, you know, or wondering what are we gonna do? Are we gonna go or just go back? Well, when this happens, it means it won't take long, maybe another 10, 15 minutes, and then they are up to it again. Well, I'm here. We'll be back when something happens. Good morning, everybody. It is a cool, brisk morning here at Swale. Um, Good news, all the Shelby ducklings are still alive and well, growing like the Hulk. Um, but we're looking at some springbok at the moment. I don't know if you can see them currently. They're just behind the trees at the moment, I think. Uh, but we're in the same area as we were the other day, as we were the other day um, where we had that African wildcat looking to hunt. So we were actually going out this morning to see if we can find him again. Um, we're still hopeful to be able to get him and possibly see another hunt. But for the time being, we're just looking at these beautiful springbok, um, I think freezing themselves at the moment, but uh, I think very happy to get out and be in the sun for a bit. It's a little difficult to see now um, with them being behind the brush, but uh, it's typical of these cold, cold mornings where you see the animals having that velvety layer almost around their bodies. Uh, you know, when they get goosebumps, just like we do, um, to form that thicker layer around their body, uh, to trap the body in uh, heat inside for a little longer. Um, as you can see, they're going, coming a little bit more into the open there now. But yeah, just a beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, now we're very happy to be back also, guys. Um, good and excited for what the morning is going to have to offer. Uh, also, after spending some time looking for the wildcat, we're gonna we're gonna head over to the meerkats to see how they're doing. Um, with it being a little cold, we're just gonna wait a little bit longer uh, for it to heat up before they're gonna g come out. Uh, but we are in contact with our meerkat habituator, Veronique. So she'll let us know as soon as there's some action. Um, if not, we'll, we'll head over there in any way and wait for them to wake up and then we'll do. Uh, but I, I believe that you guys are enjoying lots of different beautiful sightings at the moment all over. Um, but yeah, just very happy to be... Safari Seth just had an excellent question. Is the Springbok and the Thompson's Gazelle the same? And no, they are both part of the ruminant family, so... Um, Ancestral, I think they come from the same line, uh, but definitely not the same. You don't typically find the springbok uh, all the way up north. Um, so Thompson's gazelle, typically a little bit more bulky, um, more muscular, and find them all the way up in the in the Maasai Mara and the Serengeti, so central and eastern Afri Africa. And then the springbok is typical to almost more arid environments. Back in the day, you'd find them all over the southern Africa. Um, they had quite large migrations. We were actually talking about that the other day, um, of where there were these books that I've in the area where I come from, which is called the Springbok Fluchter. So close to the Waterberg mountain range where I grew up. And they speak of Springbok migrations there being larger than the ones that we currently have with the Blue Wildebeest and the Maasai Mara and the Serengeti of about seven and a half million individuals where towns would close and actually the people within the town at that time would move out of the area just to avoid that migration when they come through um, because it would take like 10 days for them just to move through a particular area. 
Um, but to answer your question, no, not the same. Uh, Springbok, a little bit more arid environment, a little smaller because of that. You know, it pays off to be a little smaller to uh, be able to function with less nutrition or, well, food and water for that matter. Um, also, heating up and cooling down a bit more efficiently, uh, whereas the Thompson's Gazelle, you find them more in tropical environments like the Serengeti and the Masai Mara. We got like a huge congregation of birds here and not sure exactly, but the last uh, few days in the afternoons in the Masai Mara, we have had some rains. And what happens when it rains, we'll get all the worms or all the invertebrates underground will definitely rise up and shine. And when that happens, we get all these birds coming to feed on the same. We've got so many bird species in this one particular area that we call the marsh area. Maybe not the marsh anymore because not much water has been on it and not much uh, vegetation that is very similar to a marsh area. It has been rather dry, but I think the rains are coming back. And once the rains come back, they have brought all these birds that you see here. We got the sacred ibis. That's what you see with the black beaks there. They're the big ones there are the greater egrets. And I'm sure we can hear them uh, feeding or just moving around. The smaller white ones are called the cattle egrets. We also got some herons there, the black headed heron. And notice how busy all of them are feeding. Now look at the heron there in between. The, that one just dived on something. Not sure what she caught, but the feeding habit of the herons is very different from the sacred ibis and from the egrets. They're always very patient. They look at their prey. They wait until the prey makes a move and then they pounce. But all the other birds are just disturbing the grass and picking on anything they would get. And we've noticed sometimes they just pick mud and squeeze it and see if there's, there'll be anything to eat. And you can see the heron is quite tall than the other bird species. Oops. Maybe it could have been a frog that came out or maybe a catfish and they all got scared. We just had a frog. How beautiful is that? And remember, we are coming uh, to you live. Should you have any questions or comments, please send them through. Hashtag CGTN World or hashtag World Earth. Great sound to hear there. Now, definitely all the species are here because of feeding. That's why. They're all different species, but they know they have to feed, and especially in the morning before it gets very hot. Terry, if you're asking how far this is from the river, we are about what? We're about three, well, I'll put it four kilometers from where we, from the, where the river is. We're about uh, four kilometers from where Isaac is. The big trees you see there, Terry, the other side of those trees is where the Mara River is. There are lots of birds here, but most of them are the egrets and the cattle egrets, the small ones. And I think as it warms up later on in the day, they will go follow the big herbivores because the big herbivores will be moving the grass and disturbing the grass and that's where they'll be catching some insects for themselves. And I'm sure, talking about the big herbivores, the most birds here that you see, they'll be eating 
invertebrates of any sort, any crustaceans, any worms, the big ones that can catch frogs, they'll eat frogs, they'll also eat mice, they'll eat rats, sometimes they also eat scorpions, anything that's moving here, millipedes, centipedes, that's what they'll eat. The heron, like that one you see moving to the right there, uh, the other day I saw one that caught a mouse, and as soon as the mouse was dead, it just swallowed it in under three seconds, shoo, and just went down. Now, talking of big happy birds, as I was talking earlier, uh, I'm talking about elephant. You'll see that these birds are going to leave uh, the marsh area and go join the big happy birds like elephants or buffaloes, because as they move on in the grass, as they feed, they'll have a lot to eat. And slowly, you're going to see a herd of elephant that is going towards the marsh. And most of the egress that you have seen here later on in the day, they are going to spend uh, the better time uh, of the day with elephants like this. Welcome back to the river. Yeah, I hope you're having a wonderful time. You're enjoying everything that we're sharing. Here at the river, the update is the calm is still persisting. Nothing much has happened. Looks, you know, looks like they are having small meetings, small family meetings here and there. There's, there is very minimal movement. You know, there is a lot of ta tail wagging, and you know, you know, like uh, staring at the river. That is all that is happening. There hasn't been much. Uh, just to remind you. This is part of the whole experience here at the river. Is that Erica? You ask which animal is the most successful at the crossing? Yes, I would say for me it still stands to be the zebra. We rarely see very few, you know, zebra casualties. So it stands as the zebra. It is the successful. You know, one I have seen Thompson's gazelle cross. As little as they are, they are very good. But when there is a gang of crocodiles at the river, none of them really succeed. For the wildebeest sometimes the current does wash them downstream the toppy they are not as many so i won't put them in the competition so the zebra takes it for me i'm just talking about the tommy there was one very horrible or i would call i would put it as crossing gone wrong where you know about 17 thompson's gazelle crossed and none of them made it you know i saw a few of them being swallowed whole by the crocodiles I would call it, uh, you know, a crossing gone wrong. So, you know, the the Thompson's gazelle lose it. The zebra stick it on my side. Yeah, there is still lots of calm. This is typical of our crossing here. You have to have a lot of patience, a lot of time. And as I always frame it and put it, nature is very unpredictable. If you give it a bit of your time, it can show you a very beautiful side or a hidden secret that it never shares with every, you know, anybody or everybody. So by giving it time, it can, you know, things can turn here and they can go down any time. So I'm not leaving here, so don't you go away. Very correct, Isaac. Be patient. That's the rule of the game when you go waiting to see a crossing. And for me, I'm just having a wonderful time here. I'm not patient, but I got elephants, I got birds, as we were watching earlier. And this herd of elephants is heading to the very center of the marsh. The green that you see there, that's actually the area that you call the marsh area. And the background is cut, and you see from where we live, our camp is around that area. And that is the Ololo escarpment. 
Now, for the last few weeks, I would say, we have not been seeing elephants coming to this marsh area because it has been very dry, which is quite unusual. But under normal circumstances or when we have the normal weather conditions, this area will have elephants the better part of the day. Look at the tusks of that huge elephant there. She got very huge tusks. Quite long, and that's very beautiful. And Lauren, elephants eat differently. Of course, depending on the size, sometimes depending whether they are males or females or their physical condition. But we've seen elephants doing anything from 150 kilograms to about 300 kilograms of food in a day. They eat so much because we all know that the uh, digest um, the digestive system is not very efficient and they only put to good use about 40% of what they eat. So anything 150 kilograms to 300 in a day, it's no more for a fully grown uh, elephant. Again, depending on what type of food uh, they are having and age, uh, the condition of an elephant, because when they are sickly, they don't eat as much. If it's a big, huge elephant, it has to eat as much. If it's pregnant, the same. If maybe she could be uh, lactating, she also needs to eat more to support uh, feeding her calf. You can see the pelvic of that one. It looks a little old. It looks small to me, but doesn't look to be in very good shape to me. If you look at the hind quarters there, she doesn't look as majestic as elephants are. And she doesn't also look good. She's a female who doesn't look to be in very good. Well, she could be old and maybe did not grow as much. So all of them will be heading today. They are going to remain in there. Eat anything soft they will get. And at the same time, uh, drink. Later in the day, in the afternoon, all of them are going to leave the marsh area because we have known elephants, if they spend so much, so much time in the water, they get a disease that we call foot rot. And these elephants have known with time, they'll need to come out, go to drier areas, higher grounds, and they're going to rub at their feet in the same soil as they walk through to spend the night, most likely in the thicket or higher ground. Young baby there. Three calves, in fact. <clears throat> Safari kitty, any plant that an elephant will not eat. I have no idea. Elephants ideally will eat practically everything they get. What I would want to think maybe is something we call the stinging nestle, because any time I see the stinging nestle in any area, it just outgrows the vegetation where it is. But I think elephants ideally will practically eat everything. I've been trying to think. There's one particular tree here that we call the East African green heart that is always very bitter, very spicy, that we use to make toothbrushes. And I, when I was young, I've always thought, because it's so bitter, it's very spicy, the leaves, elephants will not eat it. But many times I've seen the big bulls using their trunks, bring the branches of the same tree down and feeding on it. What a peaceful setting there with all these huge beasts feeding. And I'm sure the calves are learning how to feed as they grow older. Not here in the background, you can hear some frogs just chipping and making some choruses. And that's a very good sign that rains have come and all the species here are happy. Well, I'll move on looking for some more animals. That's a little bit. Happy. We are looking at some tracks at the moment and it's raining quite heavily. I'm gonna just jump out and show you what it is that I'm seeing. So this is the area that Tandi actually walked up. 
But if we have a look here at these tracks, these tracks are going in the opposite direction. They're going down. And interestingly, at first I thought these are leopard tracks. And then this one here, if we have a look at this one here, you can see that the toes are quite long. And that looks a little bit like a hyena. But in fact, and this is really nice because I'm telling you about how the weather and the substrate and the rain, as you can see, um, are fecking. Because that looks like a hyena shape. But hopefully you'll be able to see all the way here. I'm trying to look for one that has a distinctive three lobes. This one, uh, but it most definitely is a leopard track. This one kind of has it. So one, two, three lobes right there. So that's telling me for sure it is a leopard track. If it weren't a leopard track and it was in fact a hyena track because of the curves. See, a hyena kind of looks like it's got bananas for, for toes. So it has a curve in like that, but it only has two lobes on the palm where here we can clearly see there's three lobes and that to me indicates 100 percent this is a cat in fact this is a female perhaps tandy used this route to go down towards our camp perhaps in that direction not very close at all but perhaps she used this route to go down but she certainly used this route to come up as well interesting though I think because these tracks look very very fresh and they're going in the opposite direction because the soil is now hard from the rain it's not dusty it's dif more difficult to actually track so here I can very faintly see her tracks that are going going up towards where she left and these tracks that I first showed you were actually looking better I wonder if it's not another leopard. Even still, the end about here, you can see it's nice and sandy here, which is why they made nice tracks. Up here, can't see any tracks. Again, the soil is hard. I'm looking for sandy bits. And not. So this leopard has crossed into this block here. Sometimes you'll actually be able to see where they turn, which is really, really, really special. So this is the last track I see for her somewhere here. But then again, we know that she was also hunting. And if she was hunting, that means that she would go up and down. And she and we would have tracks going up and down, up and down. Now that is definitely tracks for a female and definitely tracks for a leopard. As you can see, it is very wet. It's truly starting to come down at the moment. You're all saying that you love the sound of the rain. The rain is spectacular, isn't it? Is it better than the sound of my game drive radio? No, could it be? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna keep on going and just keep an eye on these tracks just in case we're lucky with another leopard. Yeah, welcome back to the river and the zebra are still having their morning or breakfast meeting whether to go across now or later. The one thing is for sure, they will be crossing sometime, you know, in the morning. I have seen them, you know, you know stay for up to, you know, six hours and then cross eventually. I've seen them, you know, stop there for about 10 minutes and just go so it is still very unpredictable the only thing is we have to do is to stay here at the river and hopefully it happens soon just to explain to you in case 
you have been been with us is you know this is part of the whole migration and the migration does happen from the Serengeti to the Masai Mara every year taking around three months to be in Kenya this is a movement of animals amounting to around three million about 1.5 you know, million wildebeest 500 you know zebra um, 200,000 Thompson's gazelle and Topis eland uh, amounting to around you know 300,000 so it's a whole big movement and we do see a lot of zebra and wildebeest mostly when this is happening when they arrive here they have to cross from one side of the river to the other Olivia, you asked about the lions feeding on something. Um, I think at the last bit, please, uh, could you reframe the last bit? Do they use the migration as an opportunity to feed? Of course, of course, yes, they do. Uh, this is the time of plenty and of easy pickings so they have to take full advantage and i you know i promise you will be showing you some lions they are bloated and hyenas and leopards they are so full look even at the vultures they are soaring those ones sometimes it's even hard for them to fly so they wait for a thermal and use it to fly somewhere else and while at that height they use their amazing eyesight to locate their next meal you know i've seen vultures so full this time of the year that they can't take off they have to have a big runway so they you know usually run and run and run before taking off so olivia it is you're very right, they take full advantage of this time and it is all pred predators from the crocodile, the lion, the leopard, the hyena, the cheetah, you know, all of them jackals take full advantage of this time and they just, you know, fatten up um, to their maximum, you know, they eat as much as they can. Look at this crocodile, you know, he's, you know, swimming very slowly he's, he's been eating so well it's unfortunate we can't see his head but he's a massive one he's one of the big ones located at this stretch of the river we have very many okay looks like uh they might be a movement yes there is two saying do we go down there and then there is a few saying no i'm going off to the right remember there is about three different uh you know you know crossing points but they can't cross anywhere when they decide to yeah remember to talk to us hashtag cgt and wild hashtag wild earth question comments are very very welcome you can also you know live stream us on youtube uh, this is coming live from the beautiful Masai Mara. Yes, it's a lovely morning here. Well, I don't know what they're thinking there. But if I was a zebra, I think I would be thinking, I think it's very dangerous. It's very dangerous to go down there. So I would rather stay here, you know, for a handful of them they could stay back here because they would be in water and there's no need to go but because there's so many the pressure to have enough grass for everybody forces them to go to serengeti welcome back to ambion panda at long last, we've managed to find some cheetah. There's two big male cheetah walking through the long grass in front of us here. We're gonna have to go off road to keep up with them. So once again, please hold tight. Get them jogging along there. They're coming up to a wide open clearing here. And I'm hoping that when they get there, they stop and maybe rest for a bit. They've been walking really far as they patrol their territory. There they are up there. 
Yeah, cheetah, at long last, after driving around for hours this morning. So we did go and look for that female cheetah. We found the carcass, no sign of her, though she seems to have moved out the area. But then these two big males came through. Let's see if they maybe go and smell that big tree over there. They might go and scent mark there. See the rain starting to also come down. Look at that tail, how he's waving it against the tree and spraying his urine. You hear the pitter patter of raindrops coming down. I think we might have to go and head for some cover, everybody, seeing as the rain is coming down a little bit harder now. But there are two other vehicles with the cheetah, and so once the rain stops, we'll definitely come straight back to them. But we're going to have to run for cover, everybody. Okay, welcome back guys. It looks like there's a bit of kicking and biting there. I don't know for what reason. Maybe it's two stallions arguing about their mares. It is very typical for them to walk side by side and then all of a sudden turn or try to bark. Knees or ankles, weak points that can disable, you know, one. You know, zebras are one unique, you know, grazer that is equipped with, you know, four very sharp canines for fighting you know very much like a horse teeth them very sharp they are, they are also used for defense during a hunt if a lion gets one they can bite it and it can let go i have seen that happen yes and also you know that's what they use to fight each other during mating rights and gathering enough females to have because usually they would fight for females and they would gather about six to ten of them which they keep for a very short tenure sometimes, maybe 10, sometimes 20, because there's always problems when they're spooked, they might, you know, um, lose each other during a crossing like here, they will lose each other. And sometimes when if there is a, uh, like a stampede, they'll lose each other. So males are always fighting to, you know, have for, you know, have new, you know, mayors look at what they're doing right now. They are standing with their faces facing, you know, upwind. Navita, you ask if the, you know, the adults help the young ones during crossing. Is that what I heard? If that's so, no. It's everybody for himself during crossing. But once they're in land, I have seen stallions and mares fight back, you know, a hyena or a leopard or a cheetah or a lion when it's, you know, trying to kill the young one. On land, yes, they'll fight back. In the water, it is very difficult. I've never seen them protect the little one. There's one very little one there, two of them actually, really cute. I'm hoping, you know, when they cross, that they will go across peacefully. Yes, um, yeah, they're all standing facing towards the wind. They're actually downwind from the wind, so if anything is approaching them, they can smell it. Remember, they have very good eyesight, and this is what is called the butchels, buchels, or the common zebra. Over here, we call it punda mulia. A donkey that cries, that is what it means in Swahili, Punda Mulia. Yeah, this is an animal that, you know, in the early 1900s, one gentleman tried to domesticate it and distribute bread in one of but he couldn't manage because every time he was doing his rounds, it would kick and bite, and then they later realized that it had a very weak back and it also possessed its wild mentality. So it never, it was never domesticated. But they do make very, very good pets, very loyal. I had one as a young boy. Yeah, it looks like they're all facing away from the water, but it doesn't mean that they will leave. The reason they are here, they want to go across. And I'm hoping that very soon they're gonna go down. This usually happens every about 10, 15 minutes. Already it's been around 20. So I'm hoping very soon or later they'll head back to the river. Remember, we've had 
A good number of them cross at different points, including Topis, which is a, is a very, very, very rare sighting. Just to tell you what you're looking at over there, the forest just behind the zebra is where the river meanders around. And what you're looking way far away up there, that is the Ololo Syria escarpment. That is the western boundary of the Mara Game Reserve. You go up there and there's people, settlements, but below that, from the top down, is the Mara Game Reserve. The Ololo Syria escarpment. Yeah, the Ololo runs from a long way, almost a place called Mulot, and heads all the way to the western corridor of the beautiful Serengeti National Park. Here we are at the old hyena den, Gwen's old den. So this was used by Ribbon and by June last year. And remember I told you that I saw June when I was following Subui, the leopard. When I was following her, I saw June run out of this air. Let's come through so we can have a look and check it out. But so far, no one is around. Now you can see it's got a beautiful jack growing out of it as well as the tamboti very very nice but like i said no one is home just yet and i also don't even know if anyone's living here but it is it is a possibility and i'm happy with that possibility i am now going to direct you in the spirit of of the changing seasons to this lovely sprouting bits of green. You see these tiny little bits that are popping out. How sweet is that? Now it is next to a red bush willow but this is not a red bush willow. It is so hard to tell, it's just emerging, but if you look at how juicy those little buds are and the color of the stem from which it is coming out, it's a little reddish. But I think the best clue here is how juicy it looks, almost fruit like you would say well if you can tell me what this plant is that's starting to just come up please do using the hashtag wild earth or hashtag cgtn wild i'll try my hardest not to give it away like i did the last time we had a plant quiz <laughs> it's a little bit difficult to see because it's tangled up in the in the combretum, the red bush willow. But it is a juicy and sometimes you may say people in the bush like this plant. Cryptic clues there guys, cryptic clues. Let me know what this is using the hashtag wild earth or hashtag CGTN wild. Sorry about that, guys. I'm sure the grass was very, very interesting, so interesting that uh, Swallow lost it. Well, up here, we have a great go-away bird. It's just sitting at the top of that branch. Oh, and as always, they have to fly off as soon as I point it out. Otherwise, you know. It's not entertainment, is it? I'm just gonna jump down and grab you a piece of this plant before I give it away. I was just about to say the name again. 
Let me just grab a piece so we can have a look quickly. Before we give, or before we do our quiz answers. Oh, this is quite nice. I want to give you a piece that really shows, shows it off. Actually, this will do. Let me put that there. All right, so the question was, can you identify this plant? Ready stems and juicy buds and a very important clue, there's tendrils. Can you see these curly things that are towards kind of everywhere often. Curly stuff up there, some curly stuff down here. Indigo girl, you say a jackalberry. It is not a jackalberry. It's one of the smaller things we see out here. Something that smells quite, um, quite urine-like. Linma, you say it's a, it's a young marula just sprouting up. It is not. It is not a young marula. They bear fruit like, oh well they are fruits, we just don't eat them. Let me get out a, a pointer friend for us. Oh, Nicola, you say a common wild pear. That sounds very fancy, but it is not a common wild pear. Let's look at a few things. See these tendrils? These are round, these round things here. That's what this plant, which doesn't grow very tall, uses to hold on to other plants. So this would wrap around like that and hold on to other plants. Now usually, this is all dried up now, but it's just green starting to happen. But these tendrils will be nice and green very soon and they'll start to creep and crawl onto trees. These here will become really nice, juicy, bulbous leaves and fruit. Alan, you say it's a sandpaper raisin. It is not a sandpaper raisin. It's a difficult one. It's probably one that we haven't thought of in a long time because we haven't seen it for such a long time. But if I had to give that cryptic clue to you again, it's so juicy. It looks fruit-like, but we don't eat these fruits. And perhaps men in the bush. Oh, Bushfelt grape, Shadulu fan. Well done, Bushfelt or Bushman's grape. Well done, Shadulu fan. It's just starting to come out. We usually see them when it's full rainfall and it's really nice and wet out here. And you can see it's still got a while, a while to go. These tendrils are dried up from last season. A while to go. And you can see these juicy bits are really coming out. And you can also tell by the color of the stem. And even if I move the stem like this and you see the inside, not woody. Can you see that? It's quite green inside. It's not very woody. And that's basically a shrub. For it to be a tree, it would have to be woody. Now that doesn't just mean, that doesn't mean that the whole thing has to be, for it to be a, um, a shrub, it doesn't have, to, for it not to be a shrub, doesn't mean it has to have no wood at all. It can still have woody bits, but essentially, it cannot be used as wood and it will not it does not have the same support structure that wood does to have to give rise to a really large big tree well done shadulu fan i must say i'm impressed because this is the first one that i've seen that's budding and i thought it looked really good i'm so glad you got to see the tendrils as well and at the end of the day we learned something and shadulu fan All right, guys, so we're back at the Meerkat Burrow. Um, this one is by far 
from what it looks like, their favorite one for the rock stars to use. We call it the far burrow. Um, and we were just discussing earlier, so by the way, just we haven't had any of them come out of the burrows yet, still sleeping, still cuddling a little bit. Um, but we were just discussing earlier um, about how important it is for these little guys to have several burrow sites, you know, um, for them to be able to duck into one at night, which is not necessarily the same one every night. Um, and there's a number of different reasons why it's important for that, you know, for them. They, on average, forage about 4.A, so with that being the case, it could be in a straight line in one direction or out and back. So, you know, they can use the same burrow twice or three times um, consecutively in a week, um, but also, also very important for them to be able to go in a straight line in one direction and be able to forage in that direction and when they get to night time have a safe place to duck in. It also helps to have several burrow stations to be able to, uh, you know, not have the parasite load get too high in one particular burrow station. So Cecilia had a very interesting question. She asked, does this biodiversity change between wet and dry season? And to a certain extent, yes. Cecilia, I mean, the animals don't really change. There's no, no change in uh, species that comes in and out apart from the birds, I suppose, um, the migrants and so on, and then also the insects. So to answer your question, for summertime, the rainy period and so on, we definitely have um, a higher biodiversity um, here at Swallow than during winter time when it's dry and when most of the migrants move away and also when it's cold you know it's not necessarily a, a matter of water um, but also temperature that drives some of the species to migrate to warmer climates um, but then again also I mean temperature and water is almost in the uh, straight line with one another so um, when it gets cooler the water goes down and there's more and therefore the animals move um, if they are able to. Um, the plant diversity also goes down a little bit. You get a lot of plants that go dormant at the moment, not a lot of grass cover everywhere, uh, just a couple of stubs here and there, uh, whereas during winter to uh, summertime, when the rains have come, we'll have plentiful grass growing thr right throughout here, and predominantly what we call sour grass, which is what these guys are. Not necessarily the most nutritional um, plant, but I mean it gets the job done in the Kalahari, uh, especially for things like the oryx and the springbok and so on, you know, your prime, uh, animals that primarily, primarily, that was a tongue twister, primarily tra um, grazers, they do obviously also go over to browsing when it is necessary, um, however, if they can, they'll they'll browse definitely, uh, graze definitely. Uh, so yes, the biodiversity changes to a certain extent, but not completely. Not completely, but yeah, guys, we're going to be with you. Guys, wake up, and you must enjoy the rest of the sightings for now. Good luck. Hopefully, the meerkats will come out, and seasons always make a big difference on what we see out here while on safari. Now, I got a huge out here and uh, I want to ask you a question uh, I would like you to tell me which raptor do you think this is is a bird of prey and just look at her carefully and tell me who do you think this is you can send your answers you can tweet hashtag CGTN wild or hashtag wild earth on what raptor we could be looking at it could be a bit of a challenge because I think it's a juvenile one, and if I'm not wrong, I think uh, it's a young one and maybe doesn't have all the colors you'd expect to see on her. But who do you think this is? Look at the clothes and see how long they are. And the only clue I may want to give you, when you see them feeding, they'll go on dead trees and any, any worms they might get or cheeks of other birds or eggs of other smaller birds and when you see them feeding they tend to stay like 90 degrees they're able to balance very well 
and you can see their knees almost swinging like 360 degrees on their knees as they feed. I hope those two, three clues are important or are enough to give away the bird. Rosemary, you're guessing a hawk eagle is not bad, but I tell you, as an eagle, you got some good points. Not actually a hawk eagle, but keep trying, keep trying. Which hawk do you think this is? Karen Marshall eagle, not quite. For an eagle, you still got a point, but not quite. Keep looking, and I've given away some important clues. When she feeds, she balances very well on trees, and she can stay like perpendicularly on trees and balance very well. She goes to dead trees or any trees that are hollow and will feed on anything she would catch, cheeks of birds, eggs of birds. Gina, Tony Ego, getting close. Tony Ego is what we had earlier. You remember where we saw the two sub-adult males that were feeding, two sub-adult males of lions that were feeding on the buffalo? We had uh, a Tony Ego on a tree, a marabou stock on a tree, right back to vulture. That was the Tony Ego. And the Tony Ego are more brownish in color. The only challenge here is this one is a juvenile. Jane Snake Eagle getting very, very close. So let me first give you a clue. Let's first call it a hawk. Eagles is under, you know, eagles, but it's a type of a hawk. Let me see whether that will help. It's a type of a hawk. But they all have the, those similar characteristics. Greg, very well done. Excellent. 10 out of 10, African Harrier Hawk. Excellent. African Harry Hawk is the correct answer. And it's a juvenile. And sometimes we also call her the gymnogene. Well done. Now, Bang Yang, that I think where the challenge came in. Otherwise, they have some bird. When you look on their breast, they have like bar black and white lines. And the orange is quite clear going all the way to the eye when they're fully grown as adults. Of all the hawks, when you see them feeding, you just enjoy watching them. They fly, they land, and they'll feed at any angle. My guess is she could be looking for something to eat from a distance. But for now, she's just sunning herself. Beautiful light she got there. And you notice she blends in very well because she chooses uh, such a dead tree. Haha. <laughs> so, oops, sorry, Bungay there. So, we we'll just have to move on and let her enjoy the day and the sun. Have a good day. Keep sunning yourself. Moving on, looking for some other good stuff ahead. We find it fascinating to see okay. Well, back at the river and back at the river and uh, what is what now? Yes, they're all milling around, all standing there. Nothing much has happened. They're still discussing, they're discussing, they're still thinking. It is very typical. It is part of the uh, crossing behavior. They, they have to sometimes stand there and decide, you know, when to go. Is that a topi? No, it's not. It's part of a termite mound. So it is not the uh, the time for them, but who knows when. It just takes one to start walking and they will walk towards the water. Remember, this is part of the remaining few that uh, got left here. We left them yesterday evening after the crossing we saw, and they might be crossing today this morning 
Uh, over there also, do we have movement? Oh yes, we do have a few wildebeest and most of them are lying down. Those two are walking. It means they might encourage or, you know, like the other ones might you know, join them on, on the walk, either outside or outwards or towards the river. It is very typical for these animals to do this, but we love it when they gather up and uh, crowd Ken, am I able to cross the Mara River with my vehicle? Using the bridge, yes. Using the bridge, yes, you can cross. Uh, there is a time way back um, when one bridge was broken and it was the only access for the fuel truck to bring fuel in. This was um, late 90s and few camps were forced to drive across there is only one section um, that you can do that i don't know how good it is now or when it was last used but then we did use it a few camps that were there but i would encourage it it is very dangerous you might lose your vehicle if you get stuck you might be washed downstream you might get eaten so we don't use, we cannot cross using the vehicle. We use bridges. Although they are far and few, we use them. We don't encourage, you know, wading or driving across. It is a very dangerous river, full of rocks, sand, mud. Um, it's not even on the, on the ground. So it is not advisable to, to, actually drive across looks like there's a, you know a little movement of the zebra you see those three from the left that's all you need to start you know tree you know triggering a movement we have the rare spotted green land cruiser driving with a few homo sapiens uh, ready to enjoy this um, fantastic you know scene here uh, waiting for the for the crossing Yes, uh, they all stopped again. Nothing much is happening. It doesn't mean that you know they won't be going. Remember, this is life. This is coming from the Masai Mara, and this is the annual migration of wildebeest. And when they do this, they crisscross the river at different points. You're always very lucky to. Uh, so um, you know, catching one is really a bonus, and that's why I am stationed here so that when it happens i can be i can i can be here to share it with you oh i really hope that we get that such a spectacular event really mother nature gives to us so many events like really special now in the vein of den searching i've decided let's check out our den that we know is active. See if anything is happening there, but really from the road I can see that there's impalas around. Which generally would mean that the adults may not be around, but it's still a little bit north of the actual den, uh, the den itself, so perhaps they will be there. Fellow, you would like to know how many antelope species we have in South Africa. I'm sorry, guys, my rain roof's just come loose, so we're just gonna have to stay still for a moment. Multiple, 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 multiple in Africa. That is quite a question. So let's start with the ones we have here Steenbok, Daika, Impala, Waterbuck, Kudu, Nyala, Bushbuck. Um, did I cover all that's here? Missing anything? Okay, let's move on. Eland, um, Orubi, Sunni, Red Heart to be East. Tick, tick. So I've counted 18 already. Right, did I? Or did I count 13? 
Can't keep track. I hope that you counted. And I'm sure that I've been uh, I've missed some. Oh, Springbok. I'm sure I've still missed some. There's so many antelope. Antelope are so diverse, and that's because they're a great prey species, and also they're a primary consumer. So the energy that gets, or the plants that convert the sunlight and water into their energy and oxygen, those plants have a whole lot of nutrients and energy just waiting for other animals to come board and have a bit of it. And those animals are the primary consumers of those primary producers. I'm sure I've missed some. Let's have a look in the mammal book quickly. Although this is not a list type of book, but I'm sure we can figure out if we've if we've missed any. Let's see. Buffalo are also antelopes, by the way. Ungulates. No, technically antelope. Oh, wildebeest. How could I forget a wildebeest? Black and blue, for that matter. And how did I forget? Oh, blessbok. Oh, hemsbok. Oh, reedbuck as well, and a, um, yes, reedbuck, uh, red dica as well, not just a grey dica, or the common dica. Um, Lichtenstein's hartebeest as well, clipspringer, how could I forget a clipspringer? Uh, okay, oh, no, we did see in book, we did see in book. Um, Sunni, we missed the Sunni. How did I miss a sable? Sable as well. We did bushbuck, we did eland, nyana. Sit the sitatunga. Love that name. And we definitely don't get those here. Sable, rowan. What book? Yeah. Oh, Lichwe. The last one I have here is the Puku. I think that's about it, guys. I may have I've missed out some subspecies in between, um, but that's a lot of antelope. And I, like I said, they're so diverse because they're the primary consumers of these primary producers, these amazing plants. Anyway, let me fix my rain roof. Good morning and welcome to all our viewers to and beyond Ngala. This morning we are at the riverbed. Um, we, myself, I'm Yapi, and behind the camera we have Gareth. Now, we are currently busy looking for any sign of anything. We had lion tracks early morning and the lions crossed out of the reserve at the moment. But we're not sure there might be signs of them if they took a huge loop and they might have come back close towards our eastern side of the reserve. So, as things stand, the rain gives a little bit of a tricky situation in terms of finding animals. Uh, it will be trickier to see tracks in the sand. And if the tracks were from last night, then it would probably be completely obliter obliterated by the rain. So, we were hoping, I am very happy to be out and about as well. It is always nice, even though it's raining, it creates a completely different um, atmosphere in this area. Animals act differently, they are impacted by the rain, and some of them are actually quite active. Contrary to popular belief, some of the cats, they're really active because it's nice and cool, it's easy weather for them to move in and they might even use it to their advantage for a hunt. So at this moment we're taking a slow drive, we're checking all the big trees in the area and we're trying to see if there might be any tracks that's crossed over the sand. If it is fresh tracks it means the top layer of the sand that's wet will be broken and then we'll be able to see something moved here just now. But 
the area that we're driving in at the moment, you can see there's a lot of reeds near us in the riverbed. And these reeds are all more or less the similar height. And that's because the elephants, during the dry season, they usually come to these parts of the riverbed and then they eat the reeds. And they crop it down all the, to the point where they're almost at the same level. Now it's just started raining again a little bit. I can see lots of signs of elephants that's crossed about. Um, we are hoping to get lucky with any signs of leopard this morning, maybe. I think there might be something there. We're just going to have a quick look. I would love to see some leopard this morning, even if it is a leopard with a young one. Now, I just want to have a quick look. It looks like we have some leopard tracks here. <laughs> we do have some leopard tracks. It looks like it might be a female leopard. She's come from that bank and she's walked down across this side and it looks like it's pretty fresh. It hasn't broken through to the dry part of the sand, but the sand over here is quite soft, so the rain has seeped in deeply. Now, they're heading up to the bank behind us and I think what we'll do from here is we'll loop around and go see if we might find something. All right, that will be good stuff. So let's see, maybe this rain is a bit of a blessing this morning after all. Well, we've got some big mammals here that I want to show you because we don't see them as frequently. And the mammals you're seeing here are some huge antelopes. In the mara, they are very common, certain areas not. And these are the elons. And apparently I've been looking at the hawk that we just saw earlier, and I might maybe change my mind and apologize. And I think we have one of the viewers that said that could not be in the gym region that I thought it was, but the Western banded snake eagle. You remember I was saying when these birds are juveniles or when they're young, sometimes they always also mix us a bit. I think one of the viewers said it was the Western banded uh, snake eagle, which I think that should have been the correct answer. I apologize for that and not uh, the gymnogen or the African hairy hawk. Now look carefully there that is seated down there. And that's a Neeland. And if you look carefully, he is grayish. And normally the males, as they get older, they get dark and a bit grayish. And being ruminants, you can tell, he is just chewing cud in those thickets of the orange rift crotons. And also trying to hide, I would say, you know, keeping away from the predators because if you look at that uh, break of himself and the bushes there, it gives a clear break from being spotted by the would-be predators. The one on the right, my guess is a female, a little brownish in color. And apparently they're both browsers and grazers. So they'll eat small twigs and leaves. It's always exciting to see some different. Maybe not as exciting as lions or cheetahs or leopards, but to see species of animals that we don't see every other day, I think is quite cool. They also tag along with migration of the wildebeest and the zebras, but not as big numbers as the beasts and the zebras.
If scared, these are the antelopes I know that jump highest. And of all the ants are the largest. When all the wildebeest and the zebras will be gone after the migration is over in this area, the predators will be left now bringing down the buffalo, like what we saw earlier, hippos or elands. DJ, good question. You'd like to know if the females also have horns like the males. Yes, both sexes have horns, both males and females, but the males have larger horns than the females in general. If you're lucky to see one come out, you'll also see the males have what you could dewlap some huge mass their necks, and the males have much bigger dewlaps than females. But yes, correct, both males and females uh, got the horns. It's an elephant there feeding. Strange to see to see her alone because they don't see any others there. And I'll be moving on to look for more animals. Welcome back to And Beyond Pinda. Myself and Craig have headed back out after we got <laughs> we got chased back to cover by the rain. It seems to have cleared up a little bit. And luckily those other vehicles stuck with the two male cheetah. And so we've now well, at long, at long last, they've actually stopped. They've been walking very far, very quickly, like we saw earlier, patrolling their territory, scent marking as they went, and they've lain down now in this in this burnt patch. Look at how much they stand out in this kind of sea of burnt grass. Oh, there's a bird of prey that's just landed in a tree in front of me. I just want us to have a quick look at it and then we can come back to the cheetah. It's a long crested eagle, everybody. Just over the front of the vehicle. See the zebra there on the right, busy staring. And there's the eagle, the long crested eagle, perched on that little dead, that little dead branch. And this area has recently had a, a small fire that's come through. The fire has, has, um, has died out. But with that burn, uh, as sad as it seems, there will be lots of little creatures that'll s suddenly be very exposed. Um, and that's what this long crested eagle is no doubt looking for. Little rodents, little birds, um, even things like snakes and lizards that don't have any more cover to hide in. Look at how the zebra are busy staring at it. Oh no, maybe not at the eagle. They're staring at something on the other side there. Again, quite a quite a harsh landscape, but but interesting to see the to see the zebra and the cheetah in that landscape. We'll come back across to the cheetah now. Still lying down there. Wow, look at how easy it is to spot them from a distance. That very pale colour against the very dark background. Apparently lots of you commenting on how light the cheetah look in colour. Um, I think it's, like I was saying, just the, the contrast of, of their lighter bodies against the dark, the dark burnt ground, but certainly the further cheetah away. Um, you may remember from a couple of evenings ago, from two evenings ago, we spent the evening with the two male cheetah known as the South Males. These are those same cheetah. They're quite a distance away from where we saw uh, them last time, but we spoke last time about how pale that one male looks, the one that's further away from us, the one that has the chewed up ear. He's very light in colour, just a, a, a genetic, just, it's just his genetics, just the way he is, like we spoke about this morning with giraffe and how genetics will affect how dark the coat um, of a giraffe is. It's the same with his cheetah. And look at that one male on the front there, how alert he is. He's busy looking at something. I wonder what he's seen. He's looking down into... There's a little bit of a dip there. And looking at their bellies as they walked around, um, they didn't look like they were terribly hungry. They apparently, while we were sheltering from the rain, they apparently caused a mass stampede of, of zebras and wildebeest um, <laughs> across our airstrip. Um, but yeah, they weren't actually hunting them. I think it was just the fact that the zebra and the wildebeest were surprised by them and they didn't want to, to stick around to find out if the cheetah were intent on hunting and so they ran away very quickly 
but um, the fact that apparently there was a small zebra foal in the herd too, uh, an animal that these male cheetah are definitely big enough and strong enough to try and it doesn't seem like food is what is what is on their mind. Um, I think like we said earlier, we saw how they were walking quickly and scent marking. That seems to be what they what they are, are up to this morning. They've got quite a quite a big territory and having such a big territory means that you've got to keep it well scent marked. There's a couple of questions about the, the burning of the grass and asking if it's good for animals. Um, and the, uh, ultimately, yes, it is. Although it does look very destructive and the, gr the ground does look very barren and, uh, and obviously fire is something that's very dangerous to animals. And yes, if there's a fire, there are many animals that might not be able to escape. Normally smaller things uh, like mice, sometimes tortoises, snakes, um, obviously many invertebrates are unable to get away. And yes, so lots of lives of smaller animals will be lost. But in the greater scheme of things, um, most of the grasses in the savannah biome, they need fire to stimulate new growth and to maintain the, the landscape at its optimum kind of carrying capacity and its optimum um, health, if you will, in terms of the, of the vegetation. And so even though for now it doesn't look so great, in a couple of weeks' time, after we get a bit more rain like we've had this morning, there's going to be new lush grass that's going to start growing through, that's going to be super nutritious, for all different kinds of grazing animals, everything from little invertebrates up to elephants and white rhinos and buffalo uh, and everything in between. And that will then of course pro obviously provide lots of food for, for herbivores and that will then in turn feed, feed the carnivores too. So although for now it doesn't look so great, it is ultimately um, very important for the savannah ecosystem that there is fire that does kind of burn off all the old dead um, the technical term is moribund uh, and then allow for new grass to grow through. It also, <laughs> it also can make spotting predators like, like cheetah from a, from, from a, from, from a distance uh, a bit easier. Scott, you're asking if that one male cheetah has a collar? Yes, he does. Scott, so I mentioned the other day that these are two new males that have been brought in from another reserve not far from here and the not far from here to really diverse a population as possible if you've heard it's got but quite a, quite a threat to cheetah is lack of of genetic diversity and so in areas Of, of genetic diversity and so in areas with a the, the one the one so we are still driving around and my rain roof rain roof is not being very forgiving but it's okay it's okay everyone I was, so I'm on Rebecca's Road and I'm heading north on it, but I'm going to get to the junction with that magnificent tree, my favorite tree, very, very soon. And I wanted to chat to you about it just a little bit, much information before we get to the tree, you see. But what I will tell you about is the fact that everything that you see as we're looking at this landscape, every single thing is connected. This marula is sending information and nutrition to that marula and to this marula and that marula and they are prioritizing themselves over say the combritums and all of this is constantly happening, constantly happening. Remember I told you about the battle that's happening underground between trees and grasses? There's a different type of, not just one that is of the battle type but one of care and and share which is quite <laughs> JC you would like to know if I'm in tree shala mode today definitely rainy days leopard with a scrub hair in her mouth I can definitely sink into tree shala mode we're almost at the tree guys almost there it's just that I can't drive very fast. 
Let's blame, blame our rain roof. At least it's not raining too badly anymore. So we're speaking about this connectivity and how plants share nutrition or nutrients. They will sometimes use this, this connectivity that they have for malice. And uh, sometimes creatures will use this type of network to seek out root systems, to find a way to infiltrate the root systems of trees. We call this magnificent network the mycelia network. Just gonna go slow here. And it is a result of a fungi that grow underground. So every fungus that you see, you're familiar with, be very familiar with. That's just the fruiting body. Beneath it, they have root-like things called hyphae. And those spread out kind of looking like cotton. If you imagine each strand of cotton, very fine. And we call that the mycelia or the mycelia. And when it connects other plants with the mycelia network. Here is my lovely favorite tree. Now, the reason that I came to this tree is because this Bellanites or torchwood must be quite old. I have no idea how old it is, but it must be quite old and it's also quite large. And the way that the mycelia network works is that you get hub trees. I can hear elephants shouting close by. You get hub trees or or mother trees. And these are trees that are particularly well plugged in to this mycelia network that's underground, which is going for kilometers, not depth wise, but area wise. And it's connecting this Balanites to any other Balanites close by, as well to all of these combretums and quarry bushes. All of that, they're all connected by the mycelia. And I call this a mother tree or a hub tree because it, has the, it would have, compared to the other trees that are close by that are substantially smaller, it would have the greatest number of myco mycorrhizal fungus. So you'll get different varieties of mycorrhizae and the large big trees like this will have the biggest variety. And why would the mycorrhizae want to have a partnership, a symbiotic relationship with these trees? Mycorrhizae struggle to get carbon and they need carbon, but they are very good at getting phosphorus and nitrogen, something that trees struggle to get. So in exchange for carbon in the form of sugars from the tree, the mycorrhizae gives the tree phosphorus and nitrogen. So they have this connectivity going on. Now, trees that are plugged in to the central mycelian network or the CMN, those trees have a higher survival rate. Also, trees will prefer to give nutrients to their kin, which is amazing because it means to some extent, although they don't have a brain or a nervous system, to some extent they, can, they know their kin which is amazing. They'll prefer to give nutrients to their kin. As well as these trees, if say you are a, a Temboti, for example, and you really, really want only your kin to survive, they will disrupt, disrupt the flow of nutrients to other plants except their own. Also, if a tree is dying, that tree will send uh, like an, a burst of all the carbon it can to the nearby trees so that before it dies, it can give one last present almost to the trees around it before it kind of waves goodbye. Isn't it amazing? I think it is. And we're still looking for that leopard, but our search has now taken us back to the other bank, the southern bank of the Timavati. And along the way, we didn't quite find a leopard, but we found this leopard tortoise. You can see it's very, very 
carefully moving into the grass. It's quite a small one, a very, very young one. And it's blending in perfectly. It was an amazing spot from Gert. And the other thing, this is also a creature that this time of the year we don't see that often. So seeing this one walking around at the moment means that we've the soil is quite wet. There's at least a puddle here or there from the rain. And we usually see them emerge in Oh, it looks like they might be moving, or him or her. I'm not sure about the sex. It does have amazingly beautiful colors. It's blended in perfectly. You can see it. The larger this tortoise will get, the lighter it will get. It's very dark still in between the blocks on its shell. And it's probably probably gonna get lighter as it grows and the shell expands. But it's amazing how well these little guys can hide. You can see it's slowly moving. It is also a bit obstructed by the tall grasses in that area. And you often, you wonder where these tortoises hide when it's very, very dry. Horse lover, why is it called a leopard tortoise? That is a good question. I am not entirely sure exactly why it's called a leopard tortoise, but I know it does have to do with the coloration on its shell and that it is similar to the colors on a leopard's coat. But exactly if that is the reason why, I'm not sure. I'm going to have to find out and get back to you. And you can see now our tortoise has disappeared completely. I think it might actually move in there and we probably won't see him again. So I think we're going to leave him and continue our search for the leopard. So guys, still no action around the burrow. Um, it is, the wind is picking up, it is staying cold, so we've actually thought of starting to dig an own, our own burrow and hiding in that. Um, not really warming up yet. However, we did hear from one of the other oaks that our Mukala group um, of meerkats has woken up. Oh, oh, Warren, that is a very good question. Um, well, too hot and too cold. The, the question was, hot and or cold can the Kalahari get? And um, so summertime, we average around oh, 40 degrees Celsius days, uh, with the warmest ones going up to around, I want to say, 48, uh, sometimes even going over 50 degrees Celsius. Um, I know in an area called Springbok, which is a little bit further west, than Tualu, um, we had 57 degrees Celsius um, at the end of last year's summer. So boiling, boiling hot during summertime, which as you can imagine, this sand then just starts cooking. Nothing wants to stand on it. That's when you find everything hiding in the shade or in burrows for that matter. Um, and then during winter time, the coldest temperatures that we had this year was minus eight degrees Celsius. So then you get dams freezing over and all of that. So very, very cold. And because of that, um, the organisms that are in this particular environment has to be very well adapted to, um, you know, those different temperature fluctuations. So getting a thick coat of hair during winter time and then shaking that off, having a, a shorter coat during summer. But then also, like with your um, Gemsbok or Oryx, um, they have that carotid reed system in their, in their um, nose, which they use to uh, regulate their brain's temperature, allowing their body to go sky high, you know, as far as temperatures of 20 degrees Celsius, which under normal circumstances would just crash every organ inside, especially the brain. 
However, having that carotid reed system, which is like a spider web of veins in the nose, um, with him breathing in and out, that airflow through the nostrils cools down the blood just sufficiently um, so that it can get pumped into the brain and the, the Chemsbok can continue operating as if normal. Also, they adapt their habits uh, between... Okay, welcome back to the Mara. And looks like our so to cross zebras are still most of them have started heading out of the river outwards it is doesn't mean that it is the end of the crossing sometimes they walk up to 500 meters stop and think twice and sometimes i think they think you know and say why do we have to go back our aim was to cross, we should cross. Looks like our crocodile left. Okay, well, they're heading out. Yes, and so sometimes they come back after heading out you know, quite um, far out. Yeah, the heads are pointed outwards, far away into the plains. Doesn't mean it's the end of the world. At the crossing, this is a typical behavior that I have gotten used to. Hope you are doing the same. Is it ke Kef Knight? Do they cl cl cross? No, but I didn't get your name, but they don't cross at night. That is the predator of these waters. Yeah, the Nile crocodile. And this is one huge one. Look at. Sorry, that name is really difficult for me to get. I don't know if it's the comms or it's just the name. Okay, that's how quickly they can appear and disappear. And with these waters, they can be anywhere. So there's no swimming. Yeah, the wildebeest and zebra risk a lot when they jump into this water. I must consider them very, very brave because nobody in his... No clean mind would come and jump in these waters. Look at that guy, how bloated he is. He's been eating really well. You can tell from the back leg towards the head, it's, there's no like angle there. It's just around. So he's been eating very, very, very well. Remember, this is a time of the year where they gorge themselves. They eat as much as they can. And whenever they can find it, they are always, you know, feeding because once the migration is gone, they will survive on small fishes and small animals that come to drink. But if they don't find anything, they are able to go for a long time without eating, which is there, which, you know, which they are adapted to doing that. What is that zebra doing? Is it scratching its nose? Do you see it? off center yeah i think it was on its face on a termite mound or something on its forehead yeah now it's a forehead yeah usually with most animals an itch develops when they find uh, an appropriate um you know object themselves it could be a tree stump a rock a termite mound ground yeah it could be anything i have seen trees and rocks that over the years uh, because of the animals scratching on them they have become very smooth and you still find the, the animals trying to scratch there and every time they realize it's very smooth they move on and some animals know actually you know some of their designated scratching points within their area especially like elephants rhino buffalo those you know non-migratory animals that stick to a certain areas know and you will find them heading somewhere and just wallowing and then after that they go and scratch themselves on these scratching you know um, objects this is the bachelor's zebra we are looking at one of the plane 
the plain grazes of the East African plains. It's a migrant. It migrates from you know, the Serengeti to here. We do have locals. At the moment, it looks like they are leaving the river, but I am here, I am waiting, and I'm hoping you know, to either share um, a crossing or an experience at the river. And that one that's closest to us, the one wearing the collar, look at how he's just stood up. And he's looking off into the bush. Quite attentively, look at how his ears are pricked forward. And even his brother, who's head quite quickly as well. So I wonder what they've seen or heard moving around in the thicket there. There was also a little gust of wind that blew through these cheetah and new sounds that they could earlier. And it's a, a common topic of of conversation is how how alert these cheetah have to be. So I wonder if they maybe just get the smell of something potentially dangerous. All right, guys, so sorry for just jumping away. Um, we had a little bit of technical issues. Uh, however, we were talking about the different temperature fluctuations during summer and winter and how animals uh, adapt to those different, you know, temperatures. Um, and we were talking about the oryx having that carotid reed system or rita mirabilis um, where they have that spider web inside their nostrils, a spider web of veins um, inside their nostrils when, so that when they breathe, they, the blood cools down and it gets pumped back into the brain. And so, sorry, if, if, you, if you have heard this, um, I'm just repeating, we don't know when we were cut off. Um, so so that the blood is cooled down and gets pumped into the brain and the animal can continue um, as if normal, uh, allowing its body temperature, body temperature um, to go up without the animal being negatively harmed. Also, um, they definitely change their feeding habits. During winter time, you find the animals, mo most of the animals around here, feeding mostly during the day. And then during summertime, you'll ha have them going um, at nighttime with a chimsbok or an oryx, um, almost concentrating 70% of its feeding time during the night. Um, also, you'll find that things like steenbok and so on, the smaller antelope, the ones that can fit down there, uh, you'll find them hiding from either the heat during the day or the cold during the winter um, in things like artfark burrows. Also, uh, warthog burrows and those types of things, even leopards or so, will go into those burrows to hide from either one of the two temperature fluctuations. So, yeah, to come back to the question, very hot during summer and very cold during winter, which is why the Kalahari is so special, because you have all of these adaptations for both plants and animals um, to be able to deal with all of that. So, pretty cool. Um, but yeah, still no uh, action on the meerkat front. However, it is Sunday, so I suppose they can lull longer. Maybe had a long night last night. You know, in South Africa, the alcohol is legal again, so they might have had a long evening. But yeah, as soon as we as soon as we have action from them, guys, we're going to come straight back here, and we'll we'll let you know. So yeah. As soon as they wake up, we'll let you know, and then we'll get them on screen. Cheeks here, if you look carefully, which seems to be very busy feeding, and these cheeks belong to a particular bird that's called a lapwing, and this is the spa-winged lapwing, and she got two cheeks. There's that one there, and we're trying to look at the other one, and what I'm thinking, the water could be pushing some small organisms outside, and that's what they're catching and feeding on. 
That's how far the water goes. That's the other cheek there. And if we show you the mother, she is very different from them. This reminds me of the Western banded snake eagle that we had seen, that they had mixed for the gymnogen. See how they run very quickly, and any insect they would see there feed on. But when they're very young, they would be feeding on small plants, planktons that would be floating on the surface of the water. And shortly, you'll be seeing the mother. See where she is, patched up. Modulo mound. And correct, it's very cute to see these chickies here. And what she's doing, she's facing the other way, ideally looking for would-be enemies. Big birds, raptors, you know, that would come and catch any of these chicks here, or even herself. That's exactly what she's doing. She just flew to the other side, maybe getting closer to one of the chicks. She has to keep an eye on them, on how they feed, and maybe control them on the limits. They can go away from the water, but being water birds, they'll always remain near water. Now, of all the many lap here, these ones are very territorial and they will always protect their ground and protect the chicks from would-be enemies. Well, enjoy your meal, chicks, and we'll maybe see you later. And as we're still up on the bank looking for this leopard, we've come across an amazing sight. This is a Wahlberg's eagle. And to my knowledge, it's the first one we've seen of the season on Gala. Both myself and one of the other vehicles have seen it this morning, and it's been sitting perched up high on that dead tree, busy calling. Now, these birds are extremely territorial, and it might be that he is calling to his mate. And it's interesting to see it come back right to this part of the riverbed. Lots of tall dead trees here. I know there used to be nests here that some Warburg's eagles were nesting in. And I wonder if it is one that's nested in this area previously and just return to the same area. And we were actually earlier today, myself and Gert just busy talking about Warburg's eagle and wondering when they might return. And I know that some of the other people I've spoken to have said that they've seen some of them outside of the reserve. This is the first one we've seen here on the reserve as far as I know. You can see it's got its feathers puffed up, its neck tucked in. I think it's trying to insulate itself because of the cooler morning. And it almost looks like the wind's giving him a bit of trouble up there with his perch. Melody, I'm glad to hear this is a new bird for your list. And it's also a new bird for our seasonal bird list. This part of the season is usually one of my favorite parts. When you carefully start to notice when the birds return from wherever they come from, whether they come from further up in Africa, or whether they come from Europe or other countries and it's just an interesting thing to do is to note them down in the dates that they return. Now, it's not unusual to see at this time of the year but it's interesting that it came with the first real rains we've had this season.
So a bird that probably most of you have on your list are Egyptian geese, of which we have two sitting here at Indlovu Dam. They out of the most of the wind. It's very cold and blustery and even a little bit drizzly this morning, which is you know, nice for the environment, but not so nice for the animals, I think, are getting very cold. Hi, I'm Mike. Behind the camera is Seb, and you've joined the Conservancy. We're out a bit later this morning because it was drizzling earlier. But now we're just sitting at the dam trying to see what might come around. We've driven a bit of the reserve to see what's happening. And I tell you what, the animals are taking shelter. It's very blustery, very windy. Uh, and the rain, which comes in waves, is, uh, is not comfortable. So most animals are taking shelter. We haven't seen tracks or signs of the lioness we had last night. But we love, we're loving these two geese here, just watching them and waiting to see if anything else turns up at the waterhole. Very, very early this morning, before we were out, there were some buffalo here. Zaina, rainfall varies, but in the low felt region of South Africa, where we are now, we should get around about 400 to 600 millimeter, being a very good amount. 400 more or less the average, and that's what makes us have the vegetation that we have. So let's hope for a good rain year this year. We are out uh, the earlier. Uh, part of the last few years and now it seems to be a fairly wet year last year and then hopefully this is a good start to our rain season it's quite early it's only just just the beginning of of spring i suppose you'd call it and we've already got this nice cold weather and lots of clouds so hopefully this is going to bring us uh, seb's showing you this dramatic windy dark cloudy sky as you can see so hopefully that's going to bring us that the beginnings of that 400 meters of rain that we need. So the water hole is very low and hopefully it's going to hold off uh, just long enough to survive until the next rains. These two cheetah have relaxed a bit again it seems. Look at how that male closer to us, with his back facing towards us. Look at how he's lying flat on his side with that neck crooked up at an angle. Oh, he's going to roll over. So neat in the way that he did that. And it almost looked like he rolled over a little bit slower than, than Cheetah would normally do that little motion. Often when they roll over like that, it's quite a quick little flip. And I wonder if he's maybe trying his best to not get himself covered in all the soot and all the ash that's lying on the ground there. It's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to see when they stand up and start to move again a little bit later today. If their coats are any darker how much they've got, how much charcoal they've got in their in their in their coats from lying in this burnt patch. A very picturesque scene. Look at how they're lying both facing in the same direction. And this little spot that they've chosen, kind of in the middle of a, of a dried up water hole, in the middle of that burn section, nice and open all around them. A perfect spot for them to rest in the sense that they're going to be able to keep a good lookout all about themselves. We mentioned earlier they'll be wanting to, to make sure that they can spot any larger predators approaching them. But also we said that it's been at least two days since they ate last, and although they weren't that keen on hunting a little bit earlier like we said that they passed up the opportunity to hunt some zebra or a zebra foal um, and some some wildebeest it's possible that a little bit later today they might they might start to hunt again as their as their bodies digest uh, the, the the meat that still remains in their bellies and they've walked a long way at least from the last place that we last saw them they might be slowly working up an appetite. It's incredible. We often talk about how far these male cheetah will walk, and especially these two, because of the size of the area that they now kind of traverse over, they, they, they have, to have to move massive distances to keep their territory scent marked. And the other day we actually measured uh, on, on, on Google Maps 
the the distance that they had covered in a little bit, a little over kind of 36 hours, uh, assuming that they walked in a straight line the whole way, they walked about 37 kilometers in one and a half days. Um, but of course, that's just in a straight line, and these cheetah, as we've discovered now this morning while following them, although they will have a, a point in mind where they're going to walk to, they very seldom walk in a perfectly straight line. They'll zigzag here, zigzag there. Uh, as they mark their territory, they'll be looking for prominent um, trees on which to go and, and, and urinate against, or big termite mounds to climb up on and then potentially defecate on as well as part of their scent marking. So at the bare minimum, 37 kilometers in just in just uh, one and a half days it's really really impressive look at how that male on the right now starting to nod off gypsy you're asking where pinda got its name from gypsy pinda or i think more correctly pronounced pinda is the isizulu word for return and it was named pinda uh, or Pinda Izilwane, which means the return of the animals. Uh, and that comes from the past or the history of this land. It was, a lot of it was once farmland. It was used for a number of different kinds of farming, um, cattle, sisal, um, pineapples as well. And the land was returned to the wild and returned to the animals, so to speak. And that's where our name came from. And, and of those animals, cheetah were, were one of the species that had been wiped out in this area because of, because of hunting. And that was one of the first, well, it was the first large predator that was brought back into this area. Leopards and hyenas existed here already because they were able to, they were able to escape uh, the onslaught of, of humans, being able to live quite close to humans undetected are leopards and hyenas. But predators like lions and cheetah had been, had been wiped out in the area. And so cheetah were the first large predator that were re reintroduced to this region with, with the, 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 the purpose or, or the intention rather of trying to get a, a cheetah population established here so that when lions were eventually brought back, the cheetah had the upper hand. They would already know the layout of the land. They would have already established their home ranges and territories uh, and just give them a, 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 a head start on, on the much bigger and more dangerous lions. Yeah, very interesting question, Gypsy. And something we're very proud of is, is, is the success of our cheetah conservation that we've had here at Ambion Pinda since, since our... Well, since it. I'm just looking at that male at the back. <laughs> Look at how his head is drooping. Myself and Craig are going to sit here for just a little bit longer. Just with this one male looking so alert, and with it being nice and cool, there's a chance that these cheetah might still continue with their territorial patrol. So we're going to give them a few more minutes in the hope that they do that. Still with the geese, and it looks like they started to maybe feed a little bit in the water. So I think I need to correct myself. I think a while back I mentioned that they might be eating invertebrates, but geese don't actually eat invertebrates. They eat mostly vegetation. Ducks eat vertebrates and other small creatures, but geese eat eat grass. Ah, oh. Shinzi, you were asking what separates the geese and the ducks? Well, there you go. I just literally mentioned it right now. Mostly their diet. The size as well comes into it. Ducks are generally smaller than geese, but mostly their diet. Geese are grazers. They eat vegetation. You'll often find geese walking along uh, on sports fields and things, eating the grass. Uh, and ducks are generally feeding on aquatic invertebrates so insects that they find in and around the water is mostly what ducks feed on so that's the main difference right there there's probably other physiological differences but i'm not particularly aware of them so look at that oh my goodness that goose is making a mockery out of me it's busy eating a frog how dare it do that <laughs> right in front of me classic look at that okay so there you go vertebrates i mean they haven't been reading their bird books but I should know better than to say what animals do or don't eat because invariably they're going to do the complete opposite right on the camera. Classic. So look what it's doing. It's busy washing off the mud off of that uh, little, what looks like a plat anna, which is a small frog. Um, and they're going to eat it. I'm assuming they're going to eat it. I don't know. 
if it's just playing with it. No, it's definitely going to eat it there. Ooh, halfway down. That's literally ridiculous. I'm going to get my bird book out immediately and read up what they eat because there it goes. Delicious, right? What a meal. Hey, breakfast. Done. Oh, are Egyptian geese actually ducks? That's a good question. You know, I've actually heard someone say that before, and I never really at the time did much research, but I'll have to research into it now. Perhaps Egyptian geese are closer related to ducks than actual geese. I wonder why on earth they're called geese then. I'm just going to do um, some research as soon as I can to figure that out. But there you go. Hey, so goose, Egyptian geese do sometimes eat vertebrates, like frogs. So what it's doing now is using its bill. They've got a very sensitive bill, and they're busy uh, disturbing the mud, I suppose. And then as a frog gets disturbed, they catch it. Seb and I watched two geese at Leopard Dam yesterday that were also diving down just with their, with their little bums in the air and their heads underwater, also ruffling in the mud. And I, I assumed they were eating little bits of algae in the water, but maybe they were looking for frogs. That's interesting. Uh, I wonder... Nicholas, I think it was Nicholas, I didn't hear quite clearly. Um, we do have the big five at Pride Lands. We saw a lion yesterday and buffaloes. They were interacting together, which is always amazing. Uh, as you know, we have a lot of elephants. We see them at this particular dam all the time, most afternoons. Uh, we often have them mud bathing. Um, and yeah, leopards all the time. And of course, we're open to the Greater Kruger National Park. So of course, there's always the the uh, opportunity to maybe spot a rhino in these areas as well. We are open to the Kruger, but certainly leopards are something that we we see tracks and signs of often, but a little bit more shy in these areas. But we've seen Pixie Pan and her cubs in this vicinity of this waterhole not long ago. Seb, when did you see them last? It's like last week, right? Sorry. Yeah, when did you see Pixie Pan? Where? Yeah, when? Uh, when? Yeah, uh, like a few days ago, I think. Like, uh... Days ago. Yeah, like just over a week ago, they saw the pixie pan female and both of her cubs. Actually, had found her tracks on foot earlier that day, and then uh, Seven Taylor managed to find them, which is awesome. So, what I'm going to do is do a bit of research on, on geese in the meantime and find out what is it, what is up with them. Thanks, Mike. Welcome back to June. They often find them on termite. Often find them on termite mounds like this, feeding on termites, or sitting where these little vents are. Because where the vents are, there's often warm air coming out, especially in the early morning. You will see it. The early morning in winters, you'll see birds sitting on the top of termite mounds because termite mounds are, for the most part, um, very good at regulating their temperature. They're about 30, 32 degrees. So when it's 5 to 10 degrees in the morning and there's a vent allowing heat, find birds enjoying it like a heater, like many of us in the winter months. Like many of us in the winter months. But to this guy, it's possibly even broken open some of that new growth of the termite mound. You can see it's a little bit more crumbly. You see below at the bottom, it looks a little bit older. And at the top there, you can see that it's new growth. The, se the sediment or the soil is a little bit darker in color. And that's where the termites are active. Everyone's saying how much you love termites. Hornbills, of course, they are such characteristic birds, aren't they? Iron King made Zazu the most famous bird ever. Everybody comes to Africa goes, is that from the Lion King? And while it is a similar species, the Lion King's hornbill, I think, is from the north, from Kenya. This is the southern yellow billed But very, very similar bird. looking for some food. You can see the white on the other side is where other birds have been sitting. There's been some defecation happening there. It's possible he's even been sitting here for some time. Mmm, yummy. 
Now, obviously, they use their beak as we would fingers. So but they can't just eat things. They have to flick them into their mouths. And you probably saw that before. It's like throwing a peanut in the air and catching it. They get very good at doing that. Beaks are extension beaks or bills, if you want to call them, are basically the fingers and hands that birds have. And the shape and design of those beaks or bills uh, is ex designed to assist them in feeding. And they get vised behaviors, very specialized beaks. And the hornbill's beak enables it to do many, many different things. But one of the things it's very useful in is in its breeding. A noise you might hear. There's just a bit of wind tapping one of our little flaps. We've got a rain roof on because of the rain. And they will cement their, their, their wife or their, their girlfriend for the time being into a cavity in the tree and leaving a little gap in there that just the hornbill's bill can pass through. And she's locked inside. So, all right, guys, still no action over here. Um, we've been discussing reasons why it hasn't... I mean, you can see even the anteating chats are coming to have a look at why these guys are not out of their burrow yet and not up and going. Uh, beautiful little female anteating chat there. So, Chris had a, a very interesting question, and, and he asked whether meerkats would stay in the whole day. Uh, Chris, particular, not necessarily. Um, we were actually talking about that just now. Um, I asked Nikki, the meerkat habituator, what would be the reason for the oaks staying inside for so long? And you know, as we've seen with previous times that we had the, the rock star group, that beta female is getting really, really heavily pregnant. So. Um, it could be that it's something like that. Maybe she's uh, given birth and they take a little while longer to uh, just, you know, take care of the little ones and clean everything up and so on. And the, the others would help with that. So um, the, to answer your question, no, not necessarily. If it is like a stupidly cold day, snow and all of that, maybe, yes. But then, you know, they must have had a very, very good um, previous day of foraging, uh, not not needing to go out and eat again. Uh, I'd, I'd say on average, no, they wouldn't, they wouldn't spend the whole day in the burrow. You know, they, they drive uh, would get them out and get them going um, even if it is later uh, like this morning they would they would still go out a little bit later and start foraging um, with them being so small they need to eat quite constantly it's not like a lion that can kill something and yeah so uh, it's not like lions that can make a kill and stay with a kill for three days and only eat like even after they finish the kill wait another day before they stay and so on um so they constantly need to feed but guys seeing as that we're not really seeing any meerkats at the moment um headquarters has got a, a nice clip for you so that you can go and learn a little bit more about meerkats while looking at them actually The rolling plains of the Kalahari are something to behold. With the morning sun comes the rising of the meerkats of Swalu. Ascending from their underground burrows, these critters cannot afford to be half asleep, with predatory threads present from both the ground and sky. Led by an alpha female, the first thing on a gang's agenda is to venture out and forage for food. The surrounding is a varietal buffet However, some of the insects on offer are more heavily armed than others.
For meerkats, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Myself and Craig are still sitting with these two cheetah. And look at how that one male is sat up and is looking quite alert, a little bit like the meerkats that you just saw, sitting up on their, on their, on their back legs. That very typical upright posture of a cheetah on the alert, showing that very big chest. And that relatively small head in relation to its body size. And it's still this one male, the male with the collar, who's been the most kind of alert and not quite jittery, but every time there's a strong gust of wind that blows, it's, it seems to be him that looks around. And he's been looking off to his right now for quite some time. I don't know what he's seen. We can't quite see down there. There's some bushes obscuring our view. But whatever it is, it's obviously not requiring his, requ requiring his imminent attention as he's now looking back over his shoulder as well. Interesting to see how the one male's looking to the right and one to the left just to maintain their general awareness about themselves and kind of a 360 degree view. But seeing as these two cheetah don't seem like they're gonna get up and move again, myself and Craig are going to leave them and we're gonna go see what else we can find for you this morning. So there's another bird that's just coming towards the waterhole, although the wind is not so easy for this particular bird. It's a batalier. Uh, it's just flying in the distance there. It's very difficult to spot. Um, but with a strong wind and without a tail, or a very short tail, it's really struggling to, to make its way towards this waterhole. We hoped that it might uh, come down and land and drink, because it's not a pleasant situation for it to be flying, but it's flown off now. So <laughs> we were just talking, Seb and I, did a bit of research on these geese, right? these so-called geese which are in the whole bird book there's a whole write-up about what it eats and everything is vegetation and then there's one line right at the end which says may accidentally eat invertebrates like insects and this one accidentally ate a frog i've realized that now it was an accident it was an accidental frog ingestion but once it started it just had to keep going and we both talked about it now having indigestion that's why it's not feeding anymore it's just standing there swaying in the wind it's just dealing with a bit of indigestion it's like a vegetarian eating meat by accident you're not going to feel great about it <laughs> silly thing but um yeah also did a bit of research on duck and goose you know, physiologies and things. And yes, Egyptian geese are actually fairly closely related to shell ducks. And so there's lots of records of them interbreeding with shell ducks and fulvous ducks and um, all sorts of other types of ducks. So they're definitely closer related to ducks than to geese. So thanks for everyone who pointed that out. It's, it's confused. I mean, an Egyptian goose is a is a confused animal but was once worshipped by the ancient Egyptians as a sacred um, I don't know if it, oh look at that one maybe there's a nest there I wonder they do sometimes nest on the ground so I was reading up some more nesting stuff and they said you know about two-thirds of the time they nest on the ground and one-third of the time they might nest up on top of uh, red bull buffalo weaver nests so that's quite interesting I wonder if it's building a nest there. It's not a great place for a, a, a goose to have a nest, to be honest, with the amount of elephants and buffaloes that come down, uh, it, its nest will get trampled quite often. Well, see what happens. Still waiting for any other animals to come down to the waterhole and see what else happens today. And while Mike's waiting for the other animals to come down to the watering hole, we are near somewhat of a small watering hole and we've just come across these two young male giraffes and they seem to be feeding on what looks like a russet bush willow It's interesting, we haven't been seeing too many giraffes over the last few days before the rain came 
It was very, very windy, and I think it might be because they were moving areas around the riverbeds. And where we are, we are near the Timbavati with a very, very dense section. It's almost like this marsh-like section, this. Have a look at that giraffe's lips. Look how carefully he's stripping the lead off. Kelly, do giraffes make any sound? Now, giraffes are known to be quite quiet creatures. Um, I have heard them make some sounds personally. I've heard them alarming at lions before, which is a very odd sound. It sounds like a very soft sneezing noise. Um, and you actually wouldn't really know that it is a an alarm call unless somebody points it out. And then I've heard them sneeze a couple of times. But other than that, you don't really hear giraffes unless you hear they as they're moving and when they're feeding. I know that there are some theories that they do communicate using infrasound. But um, at this point I know it's still being studied. They do have excellent hearing though. And for them a lot of their communication over long distances is also it's also very visual. It's an animal with excellent eyesight because it is so tall and those white markings behind the ears will be able to spot other giraffe. Have a look at that one. Grab the mouthful of leaves and now it's chewing it. So let's have a look and see when he swallows it. And cleaning his nostrils. Probably picked up some pollen or dust from the leaves in the tree. Look at him strip off just the tips of the branches. And you'll notice they eat quite a lot and then chew, then swallow. Carefully maneuvers its long tongue in between, trying to grab the parts that's harder to reach. I think we'll sit here with these two giraffes for a little while longer. That was a, a really beautiful, quite massive group of birds of prey using a thermal finally half past nine in the morning and the ground has finally heated up enough for that hot air to rise and a whole host of vultures and bachelors to rise up but now they have either gone too high or too far and we can't really see them but that was really really awesome there must have been about maybe 30 birds all really large birds that would need a thermal to pick themselves up. And that's because if you think about a white-backed vulture, which is between five, five and a half, maybe six kgs, a batelier, you're looking about two kgs, two and a half kgs. They're heavy birds to get up into the air and they use these thermals in order to do it. And I'm quite disappointed that they've moved off so quickly. But also the wind has, besides the, the warm air, that rises and helps create lift for them. The wind has been pulling them very, very, very fast across the sky. So using the thermals to move vertically and the wind has been pushing them horizontally. And now they are gone. It was quite crazy. It felt like you could see patterns. There were no patterns. It's just the movement of the birds. If we have a look at that marula there, you can see that the wind is definitely picked up. 
It is swaying and swaying, and so are the other trees around it. Well, I'm going to go find some shelter in the Mulwati. Welcome back to Ambient Pinda. We have left those two cheetah and we are now. Enjoying the company of a mother giraffe and her youngster. See that little one there in front of us? Look at those fluffy horns on top of its head. You're able to see that little fork-tailed drongo flying around in front of it. Oh, and some little oxpeckers sitting giraffe's neck as well. Look how curious it is though, staring at us. <laughs> like I was saying, its mother is not far away, just off to the left here. Busy browsing on some fresh shoots coming out of some buffalo thorns. Look at all that greenery around her there. Obviously this new growth attracting quite a few browsing animals. We've seen a couple of Inyala in this area and it seems like there's quite a couple of giraffe scattered around in this little clearing seen at least three but there we go we were talking earlier about the difference between male and female giraffes in terms of their horns have a look at this female well of course now as I start talking about it she puts her head down but have a look when she lifts her head at the tops of her horns you might be able to see there we go the tufts of hair on the tops of her horns busy chewing we certainly seem to have had some pretty good luck with giraffe today. And from here, myself and Craig are going to continue driving along, um, heading back towards the area where that female cheetah was yesterday to see if we can maybe find some fresh tracks of her. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I have left the river, but not very far found one of my favorite hope the same for you this is the african elephant one of the animal in charge of making sure that we don't have overgrown or overgrowing trees and shrubs what is happening here is they're eating a lot you know you know young shrubs as you can tell they're not eating grass they're going you know slowly picking up small trees they are actually very important and they play a very big part in making sure that you know you know young trees that are unwanted are checked are kept in check look at that little guy he's staying on the shady side of the mother because the sun is getting too hot but mom is not too concerned she is well experienced and i'm sure she knows what she's doing if it was too hot she would take the little guy you know, to wear the shed. Look at how what the mum is doing with the leg. Look at that. <laughs> is it tired? Uh, yes, they make sure that, you know, there's some shrubs that can become a nuisance and can, you know, overgrow over, all over the plains. So they make sure, you know, they eat them and it is very important. And the matriarch herself, she knows where to be at different times of the year because she was taught that by her previous mother. Elephants are led by a matriarch, the most experienced female, full of knowledge and wisdom, knows where to be at any particular time. Where that young one is seems to be very, you know, she seems to be very safe from any predator because there's a distance between Amber. Thank you for your question and thank you for watching. You ask, you know, how fast can an elephant, elephant run? Well, it can run much faster than we do, believe me. And it also has endurance 
and because you think you think it's very big it cannot turn an elephant can turn at very sharp angles it can run at top speed of about 50 to 55 you know kilometers per hour that is very fast and to give you an idea of you know how you know why they're too fast they have four legs and we have two each one of their step is almost four to six of our steps so when you decide to be chased by an elephant uh, make sure that you have somewhere to jump into because none of the tree is you know big enough for an elephant to bring down not to bring down or you you know you have to go into a hole these are animals you don't want it chasing you but i'm not saying that's how we can judge how fast it runs yes it can run at almost 55 square 55 kilometers look at our task looks like it was broken it's been broken actually that is from either trying to dig soils on the ground and she misjudged the strength of the task plus the ground and broke it or either debarking a tree or even defending herself but uh, yeah either of the three could be one of them she is moving towards us there is something harming in my vehicle and I have seen in a few days it's making elephants not come too close to my vehicle so she's turning away I was hoping she's gonna have come towards me yes looks like she's very full look at that that is what carries those 250 kilograms of grass every day that's how much they eat every day this is one animal that got yeah this is one animal that converts land second to man believe me yeah and in areas where they're confined they can convert land really fast by that i mean they can destroy vegetation you know from grass to trees We've managed to find some elephants, and I'm so glad about that because I feel like my day is not complete until I see some elephants, and they have the right idea. They're in the drainage, which means they can protect themselves from the wind. Just because the wind can be a little bit irritating. a little one just come up in front of us. Hi Gianna, how are you? You have a very important question. You'd like to know how long it takes an elephant to use its trunk properly. Obviously it depends on that individual's development. Old, they are not too bad with it and if you look at this individual this individual is about three years old and you can see it's very very good with its trunk but under a year old they can still be quite funny with the use of their trunk and by two they're very good and by three they're just as good as the adult look at this one go look at that can swing its trunk around a piece of grass round 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 select a bit and pull and again it's very good occasionally you will see uh, a little youngster who's maybe a year old maybe even a little smaller and they look like they've been cultured their whole lives and that they weren't just born six months ago because they use their trunk so well. And then you might see others who are about two years old who are still trying to helicopter their trunk. That's when they swing it round and round and round. But generally by a year old, they've got some of it down. And before that, it's quite funny to watch them. 
down in the drainage there. That's a nice perspective because we often don't get to see them from so low. Hello, young boy. I love seeing the different angles. Look at that. I love, love elephants. I think they they're uh, it's so hard to pick favorites but they are firmly in the running absolutely so well i'm going to spend a little bit more time with them maybe they'll come up maybe they'll come say hi elephants are my favorite animals <clears throat> And any day see elephants is a great day. Well, we've got some hippos now out of the water. And I'm looking at the large animal elephants we shall have. We'll have hippos being number three in terms of size. And you can see those hippos out. Of course, number two are the white rhinos. And you can see those hippos are already out of the water getting a bit of sunshine. Very quietly and patiently. I'm just hoping uh, the will be in the zebra side, so from a distance, are uh, going to cross this river at one point. So at one point, or sometimes you see the hippos there just laying on the beach uh, by the riverbank to sun themselves up. But in this particular case, they are standing up. And I'm not sure whether these hippos are enjoying the current like I am here. And as you all say, this current looks very strong. Now, this river comes from some uh, forest that we call the Mao Forest. And is a forest very close to my village. And every time I'm in touch with my villagers and I hear there's some rains there, I'll always know that the current or the water, the levels will go high and the current will be quite strong. And every time I'm here, when I listen to the trumpet, I always enjoy the sounds. A very important water source for the Masri Mara Serengeti ecosystem. The hippos and the crocs cannot do much, you know, without this water or without this river. Many predators will always go for hippos, and I'm talking of lions. Occasionally, we have seen leopards going for baby hippos, but for me, the biggest challenge to hippos are hyenas, and you're going to learn more about the same. With a reputation for reaping the hard-earned rewards of other predators, Hyenas are rarely acknowledged for their hunting. Unfortunately for this young hippo, hyenas are indeed practiced predators. Separated from the Mara River by a substantial stretch of dry land, these hyenas showed off their strategic skills surrounding and taunting the hippo, hoping to push it out of the water, weakening it. The wealth of food on offer comes with its disadvantages. The hyenas were weighed down from a meal the night before, slower and slightly less enthusiastic than normal. In a moment of sheer courage, the youngster bolted for a deeper channel tipping the odds in its favor. In an unexpected turn, this could only be viewed as a happy ending. The hippo on its way back to its pod with a story to tell. And the hyenas having worked off some of their previous meal.
Life can be brutal, and that's what I've been trying to say to one of the little Ellie's that have walked through, or just come through. That little Ellie had a pimple on its trunk, and we know life can be brutal in that way. You may get pimples before you're meant to, but at the end of the day, it's a happy ending, and it will all clear up. That little one has moved off. It's a bit of a straggler, that one. That's its mum that you're looking at. And the little one, it'll come through. There we go. There we go. That one came from behind the herd, out of nowhere, on the road. As if it had been gallivant swear. a lovely Birchall Starling in shot there too. How pretty is that? I think I've got a bit of a roadblock at the moment, so I might just reposition so we can get a better look of the uh, a, better, blah, a better look at them. There we go. And then if I can manage to escape, I'll get into the Mawati. Sitting at uh, in Lover Dam, and I just happened to notice I was taking a photo with my camera, and I happened to notice just how beautiful and colourful uh, all the knob thorns are at the moment. So I think I talked about it a few weeks ago how these knob thorns were going to be flowering very soon, and now you can see these are in full flower. In fact, most of the knob thorns around this region are covered in these yellow, long bunch, bringing tons and tons of insect life to the camp at the moment. Now, obviously, in a nice or on a very cold and windy day like today, they won't get too much insect activity, but we can still hear a few sunbirds visiting the, the flowers to get the nectar and any insects that might be there. So very, very interesting to see. It's very difficult to have all the branches moving about, but you can see those lovely yellow flowers right above the tent uh, that actually uh, is shared by myself and Taylor uh, underneath this knobthorn tree over here. So there's is the tent we use and uh, and you can see the the branch that's fallen in front which I'm always terrified is gonna blow off in a in a strong wind and crush crush the tent hopefully not let's let's hope it stays nice and safe but what I love to sit underneath I know, right? It's crazy, this wind. But what's really awesome is that uh, you can sit underneath this tent, and because of this flowering knob thorn, there is a ton of life that comes to this to this tree. There's birds that follow the insects, there's insects of the flowers, there's all the other animals. The giraffes will also be feeding on any of the low-hanging flowers because they have lots of energy in them. So the giraffes are also known as uh, mammal pollinators of these of these trees, which is quite unusual. Most trees are wind and insect pollinated, but these trees are well known to also have a significant portion of of pollination happening from giraffes. Killer one has no flowers that are quite low enough for any giraffes, I think. But really look at those flowers; they're so pretty, and the little stalks that they're on are on a deep purpley red colour. So the contrast is really, really gorgeous when the sunlight hits them. I'm hoping the sunlight does come out a little bit later for this afternoon, and we'll do another short segment uh, showing you just how nice the contrast is between all these different branches. It's really, really lovely. So I'm not sure if, if you're all uh, aware of the difference between uh, the acacias now. They've been changed a little bit, and we'll discuss that a little bit later. In, in the meantime, we're just going to uh, enjoy seeing what birds might come to this tree. Welcome back to Ambion Pinda. Myself and Craig are heading towards the area where we last had tracks of that female cheetah. It's led us into an area where the soil is very sandy and we found a tree that is quite common on these sandy soils here in our reserve. It's called a black monkey orange and it's called that because of the fruit that it produces. Now here is one that is, that is still whole and see for now it's kind of a greenish a greenish color but if I turn it over over this way it's starting to go uh, a bit lighter a bit more yellow and that's the color that it'll be when it's ripe so for now um, not for now not ripe uh, and when it is ripe it is edible and it's if I were to crack this open it's quite a hard fruit almost like a gem squash and inside here 
I'm going to show you because I've got some broken open ones here. Inside this fruit is a big cavity. And hear how hard, how hard that shell is. And so inside there, there's a cavity. You might be able to see there's a couple of seeds inside there. And there's a lovely outside, uh, which is very tasty. Um, there's not very much fruit. It's kind of just a small covering around all of the all of the seeds. This, the, 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 the fruit itself is, is mainly seed uh, with just those fleshy coverings. Tastes very nice, almost like a tutti fruity with a hint of mango, a hint of flavor to it. Uh, also smells very nice. I don't know if these ones... Yeah, it's not quite ripe yet. But when it does, it smells wonderful. But yeah, a plant that we often see here in the sandy soils. Um, and yeah, something's beaten us to these ones. Obviously a baboon has cracked these open and started to feed. Uh, and hopefully later on in the year, we'll be able to show you some ripe ones and maybe even taste them. But I think myself and Craig, are gonna leave these here and we're gonna carry on down the road. Go see if we can find some more tracks of that female cheetah. And just look at that two of my favorite birds in the same dead tree. On the left hand side, we have a African Harrier Hawk, or as some might know it as the Gymnogene, and on the other side, we have a Marshall Eagle. You can see the Harrier Hawk got spooked by the Marshall Eagle. Let's have a look and see if we might see. Unfortunately, can't see the Marshall Eagle now, but when we were here, the Marshall Eagle was actually perched in a different tree and it got attacked by two bataliers. And as soon as the one batalier flew, swooped down on it, it chased it off and then the other one came and joined. So it flew just to the other side of the riverbed, perched there, and then that gymnogene or that African area hawk joined it in that tree. I'm sure it was also about to take part in the action and maybe even try and attack it as well. It's amazing to see this interaction. It's um, definitely some competition between these large birds of prey and I'm pretty sure it's also a little bit of um, general fear for that large predatory bird. So we do often see that when it's perched out in the open where it can easily be seen, that other predatory birds will often try and mob it or try and area. But it's amazing that you get to see all of these very interesting interactions along the riverbed here with the large trees attracting a lot of the large predatory birds. And also like that leopard we've been looking for all morning that also moves in this area because of the big trees here. We still haven't had any luck with her. Last tracks we had went up the bank off to our left hand side, but we haven't had anything further from that. So we're still having a lookout, we're still scanning. We want to see if we might be able to find any fresh signs of her. I still have a one minor part of the elephant roadblock. It's just this, this one here. I just want her to cross the road and then we can move on too. As she looks at us again, you'll see that there's quite a lot of white gunk in her eye. You can just see a speck there. She's quite far. Can you see that? That's a result of not having tear ducts in the way that we do. Elephants have a third island, a <laughs> third island. They certainly do not have a third island. And it is called an initiating membrane. And it covers its eye and moisturizes its eye as it goes about because eye is dry. Now we don't have that because we have well-developed tear ducts, tear ducts. See, I'm so cold, guys, my mouth can't move properly. We have well-developed tear ducts that moisten our eyes. Now, they don't. So as dust and other things build up in their eye, 
and they blink with that initiating membrane. Then it pulls it to the corner of the eye there. Now our tear ducts and the whole kind of lacrimal system extends down the side of our eye by our nose, where our cheek meets our nose, as well as on our eyelid and underneath our eye. And it is really, really well developed. And that's an adaptation to being, being on land. There are many large animals, still land animals, that once shared a common ancestor with large sea mammals tend to ducts because there was no need for them because they were constantly in a moist environment. Same goes for hippos, for example. That elephants will be streaming tears. But in fact, while they can produce moisture and produce tears, they can't, they don't have a duct and system in the way that ours do for collection afterwards. And these tears are not one of, of um, or that come from emotion. It is the basic function of tears, which is to clear the eye and also to provide oxygen to them. There are no blood vessels that carry oxygen to the cornea. If they were, then we'd see them as we look out. So instead, your eye diffuses oxygen via your tears in order to keep it alive. And that is the primary function of tears. Emotional tears is something that really has only been encountered with humans. And even that may have a different function. If you feel emotional or you feel sad, that your response in having tears might actually help clear your vision in the same way as when you're shocked, your eyes go wide and you think that's just an emotional response, that's just a facial expression. But in fact, it's not. Your eyes go wide and that means that you can see better. Your pupils may dilate, your eyelid, and that's the type of response, physio physiological response, or physical response that you will need in order to see whatever it is that's sneaking up on you a little better. There's quite a few examples of that for humans as well as animals. And it's interesting to, to think about the things that we think are so human and are just part of the way we are and it's connected to our social intelligence and our emotions. There is very likely a physical and biological explanation too. Right. A... Uh, an upthorn occasion. Oh, sorry, my, my audio is having a bit of a problem, but should be fine in a moment. So anyway, a moment ago, we were talking about an upthorn, we were looking at the beautiful flowers, and then I talked about being an acacia, and then I thought I'd point out that we don't have acacias in South Africa or in Southern Africa anymore. Um, this here is a branch from something called uh, an umbrella thorn. And as you can see, it's got small hooked thorns and these long white straight thorns. Now, generally speaking, the, the trees that we used to know as acacias are now split into two families, vichelias, which are usually the ones with the straight thorns, and the V on the straight thorns helps to help you to uh, know vichelia. So, and then the hooked thorns, uh, like a knob thorn, which is now called a senegalia, uh, has a little hooked thorn, which looks a little bit like an S, right? Uh, so this is actually called an umbrella thorn, and it is a vichelia, but it has hooked and straight thorns, so it's a bit of a difficult one. That's when we start looking at the flowers. Generally speaking, the ones that used to be called acacias that have those long straight flowers like the knob thorn uh, are called senegalias, and the ones that have uh, circular yellow puffball flowers are, are called um, uh, 
Seneg- uh, Vichelius. So it's very interesting. So remember, if you if you hear anyone calling uh, a tree an acacia, it's a throwback. They're not called acacias anymore in southern Africa or in Africa. The only acacias that you find now are in Australia, which is quite strange, don't you think? To, to know that Australia has stolen our acacias. It's all to do with genetics. But look at these hooked thorns here. We were talking about, you were talking about... Uh, uh, animals shedding tears, and I can tell you uh, we'd shed quite a few tears if you walked into this tree. Look how sharp those thorns are. They're incredibly sharp, uh, and these are very, very important to protect this tree. Uh, this, so I plucked this off of a, off of a uh, umbrella thorn that's just here next to our camp. These are very nutritious, and without these thorns, animals would absolutely destroy these trees. As it is, they get hammered by elephants anyway. They've got tough mouths, uh, but small animals like impala and even giraffes would avoid the worst of these thorns in order so that they don't get completely destroyed. Because remember, the springtime now coming, there's lots of rain falling, uh, and they need to capture as much sunlight as they can in these tiny little leaves in order to provide themselves with the energy to grow. If the leaves got uh, stripped off all the time, uh, this, this tree would not survive. So these are very, very important safety mechanisms on this Vachelia tortillus or umbrella thorn tree. Remember, Vichelia, the straight thorns usually means Vichelia, and the hooked thorns, Senegalia, that's the, that's the genus, uh, but, but this one has both, so it's a bit of a tricky one. I was trying to throw a curveball in there. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, umbrella thorn trees before. We, ours don't grow very large here, but in other parts of Africa, like East Africa, they get that beautiful umbrella-shaped uh, canopy, which is where they get their name from. I don't know if you've ever seen any before. Don't forget uh, to send your, your questions into us. We love to hear questions about the trees as well as the birds and the animals. They're all very interesting stuff. Uh, send your questions through uh, hashtag CGTNWild as well as uh, uh, at FC or hashtag uh, Wild Earth Official. The number of hippos out there has increased. And from the three or four we had, now we have about seven, more or less. But we want to show you the zebras that have kept us waiting here. And maybe very few will be in them, but the majority of the animals we are waiting to cross the river are the zebras. And you can see the distance as the camera is panning how far they are uh, from the river. It's not very far, I'll put about 200 meters, give or take. And those are the animals I'm talking about. They might remain there for the next half an hour or one hour, but you're going to stay here with them. South Africa and now it's my turn to show you a leopard here in Juma. Tandy has come back from Torchwood where she left this morning with her scrub hair prize and she took it to her cub. Now she's come back onto Juma. There you can just see her bottom now. It's a very good chance that she's looking for some some more food. Going to come out again. Now this type of behavior, her moving like this, she's looking for camouflage animals such as scrub bears, dacre, steenbok. She's a very good hunter of those small animal species. And I believe she took her scrub hair to her cup and the cup has eaten it. And now she's obviously hungry. Okay, so she's just going behind this bush. I'm just going to have to move up. Sorry about the pole, everybody. Oh, we still got it. That's good for now. Sorry about the pole, we do have a roof on for purposes of the rain. Isn't that wonderful? Leopard in the woodland of Juma. All excited to have her again. Okay, we're going to move so that we can catch up with her. She looks like she's going back towards the open there. to a termite mound. Let's just try and get a nice little gap here. I'm going to go on to this 
turn of Martin Mound. Just over here, one second on the turn up mound, and there we go. Oh, got it there. Beautiful scenes of this female leopard doing what leopards do best. This female here has taken some of her food to go. Can you listen to her crunch? Oh, you dropped it, girl. It's, it's stuck over her task. <laughs> she was feeding right next to the vehicle and then the other larger cow decided, no, she wants this combretum. So this one has got to move along. She's now sweeping the roads for us. Very thoughtful. What lovely sounds. I just love the sounds so much. Well, I think if you can see, there's an elephant in the back and an elephant here and one next to me. So I'm going to have to just wait it out and I'll probably be here until the end of show. Welcome back, everybody. There she goes. She went on top of the Termo Mount to try to get a bit of you. And now through the thickets, she walks again. This is classic leopard behavior. They, they get a bit of elevation so as to be able to spot a little ear flick or the movement of a small animal and then they'll go down from the Tim up mound and go and try pursue but doesn't seem as if she saw anything but she knows if she keeps moving she will be lucky and there she goes disappearing once more into the thickets and it looks like she's going directly east again back towards the boundary you see, they don't look at the boundaries the same way we do. For them, it's just a pathway for them to cross. And there she's gone. Okay, well, we're going to need to reposition to try to catch up with her as she disappears back over towards the east. Leopard in her habitat. Prime, prime leopard habitat. This termite mounds, open areas, thickets. Tall trees for hoisting and the preferred animal species in abundance. How awesome. We could have Tandi at the beginning of show and then again at the end of show. So hopefully that means that she'll stick around and we can spend some more time with her this afternoon. Oh, this is the larger cow that chased off the smaller one. Yeah, but she crossed back it looks like they're chomping on a variable bush willow. Look how, how cool she kind of looks with the branches all sticking up straight in front of her. Almost like she's being a little coy. She's not eating with the same feverish intensity that the other cow was. So I feel this might have been a, well, I want what you're having. like to know if these thorns would hurt an elephant. There are no thorns on these trees. And elephants seem to love buffalo thorns, which are very, very thorny and would... You will never touch a buffalo thorn again after you've mistakenly been hooked by one. 
and they don't hurt the elephant because they have such large teeth that grind and grind and grind and they have thick skin and that doesn't just mean their outer skin but also the skin inside of their mouths and their tongue really strong parts of their body so they will not get injured by thorns too much but you will find that they will prefer to go after vegetation that will not hurt them in fact, yesterday I saw an elephant get caught, its ear get caught on a thorn and she just pulled and she freed herself. So I'm not sure if that left a hole, but very interesting to see. Welcome back everybody. Well, it seems as if she's kept on our, on our side of the line. And she's found herself on top of another termite mound looking into the thickets for the slightest of movement. It's a hard job being a mother. She's got to provide food for herself and for her growing boy. Who's probably, I haven't seen him in ages, who's eating more and more each day. Seen of him of late are his tracks and he's gotten very big which means that if she brings him food, he's probably going to eat all of it. So now she needs to go and secure herself a larger meal that she can spend a few days feeding on. A day cap or a stand or even a medium-sized impala would do her very good. In these conditions, overcast conditions with a little bit of wind are ideal hunting conditions for leopards because it's cooler. It's far less energy expended on a cool day like this. And the wind helps to mask their presence and their hunting ability. The queen of Juma, everybody. She's spending more and more time on the eastern sides here, moving into Torchwood. And her daughter, Tlalamba, who we had the other morning, has definitely taken up residence in the central parts of Druma, or a female, when reaching independence from her mum to carve out a piece of her mother's territory. That's what Tlalamba's done. Okay, well, there she's moving off. We're going to need to reposition shortly. She just walked in front of that car there. And we're going to just reverse back and try and get you another view of her. Now she continues on. She can do this all day, everybody. She can do this all day long. But she's such a good hunter. She's probably going to be lucky at some point, but you never know. It could happen with us. It could happen later. Now oh. oh, she's gone into the thickets over there. We're going to do our best to try and relocate, but it is getting rather dense. Welcome back to Ambion Pinda. Have a look at this massive white rhino bull. with a little ox picker sitting on his front horn. <laughs> and a second one. Now, we've been following this rhino for quite some time, and he seems to be on a mission, just like those two male cheetah were earlier, and how they were scent marking. This rhino bull has been doing much the same thing. He's been walking, stopping only briefly to feed. He's been sniffing the ground, sniffing other piles of rhino dung. And he's been spraying his urine as he goes. Let's see what he's doing there. Okay, and just smelling the ground. Got all those ox pickers flying around on his shoulder. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to. Just 
descendants, sorry. You're asking about the difference between an elephant's tusk and a rhino's horn. Well, descendants and elephants, they're both completely different things. So an elephant's tusk is a tooth. It's the elephant's modified in size of teeth, whereas a horn on a rhino is, is obviously not a tooth. The horn on a rhino's face is made mainly out of keratin, the same substance as what makes up our hair or our fingernails. Um, and then obviously uh, a tooth is, it's not, it's dentine and enamel. And so that's the, the main difference. Um, descendants. And we often get asked about, because obviously we've spoken quite extensively about why we dehorn the rhinos here at Ambion Pinda, and we've spoken about how it doesn't hurt the rhinos because it's just like having your fingernails trimmed. Where, and, we, and then we get asked why we don't do the same thing with elephants. And part of the reason is that because it would be like, like pulling teeth out, which can be quite a dangerous, quite a dangerous thing. Um, and it will be very painful for the elephant. And fortunately for now, it's not, yeah, it's, it's not a feasible thing to do. I see this rhino still on a mission, marching down with his nose close to the ground and heading off into the bush there. There's a small water hole there. I wonder if he's not maybe going to go smell around there. It'll be a place where during the day white rhinos will go and mud wallow and then drink later in the evening. And perhaps he's on the trail of a female or, or a rival male that's encroaching on his territory. So I think we're going to go around that side and go and see where he's gone to. Welcome back, everybody. Well, we're trying to keep up with her, and she's just decided to walk behind our car. So apologies again for the pole. This is a live broadcast. And we can't always predict exactly what these cats are going to do. Sorry about that pole. I'm going to move quickly so that I can move it out of the way. Excuse me. There she goes. So this is classic sort of what you see female leopards doing, moving through the thickets. The prey that they're looking for are large and they stand still but she's poised, she's ready. You see that tail moving, moving. She's very ready to dart left or right to pounce on something that immediately darts out of the underbrush and she will catch it. Not always. Oh, there's an impala up ahead of And she hasn't actually looked at it properly there. She saw it just running. Impala just ran away. She almost hadn't even seen it. And now she's looked at them going, oh, where are you going, impalas? But her body language is showing one of, of interest, but not of, let's hunt you, because, well, the impalas have run away. Oh, now she's going to decide. Now watch her body language as she figures out. They didn't, to me, show it like they indicated that they'd seen her. They just bit. The wind, very blustery. It makes hearing for impalas quite tricky, so they're very jumpy in the wind. And a little bree leaves flicker nearby and can cause them to jump. They did an alarm call, which means they hadn't spotted her. But even in this dense woodland with her great eyesight, impalas weren't that easy for her to see. I'm obviously at a different height and a different angle, so I managed to see them. She's not trying to figure out what to do about it. Tandy moving through the long grass. Let's just try and move one more time. Get to it. Before the, before the end, who knows what we might see. She's doing what Tandy does best, everybody. Moving. Moving, moving, moving. Last minute. Let's 
see if, if we can still see her. No, I can still see her. He's not interested in this in Parla. Realized and learned today a little bit about off road driving. Haven't you, sir? Yes, you have. Okay. So stop over here. There she is over here at 11 o'clock. Behind the bush. She's just behind that bush. She's obviously stopped a little bit more left. Yes, there we go. You'll see her tail. There's her tail. She's behind. Th oh, she's moving. Some spots in the thickets. The Impala herd still has not reacted to her. I only saw two individuals, and I think the one I saw looked like a youngish male. So it could be a mixed herd. It's unlikely she's going to try and deliberately hunt a big male Impala. She'll definitely be looking for a youngster or a female. Female Impala definitely fall victim to predators more this time of year due to the fact that they're quite heavily pregnant. But there she disappears. Of course she does. Right at the end, into the thickets she goes in pursuit of some breakfast. We do hope you've all had a wonderful, wonderful morning. <laughs> I think I can still see her. Just on the top left and four. Top left. Thank you for joining us this morning, everyone. We hope you've had a wonderful show with us. I know I have. Good day and goodbye. Graham features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome to Masai Mara. Good afternoon, everyone, and we are live once again. We are at the river.